first and foremost, good morning. Thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Eric Carter. I'm with Dragonfly Energy and Battleborn Batteries. Uh, I work in the technical sales and support department. So I'm sort of the front line for the company. I'm on the phones, I'm, I'm answering emails. Uh, I work directly with a lot of the RV manufacturers and helping them support the, the batteries and the installs that, that they're offering uh, to your dealerships and at the end of the day to our, our shared customers at that point. Uh, this is my colleague, I'll let Brandon introduce himself. So I'm Brandon Newman, been with the company for about three and a half years now. I come from the technical specialist background as well, so working with dealers. I now mainly focus on newer markets, kind of focusing a little bit away from RV, but my background is the bread and butter of our main market, which is RV. This guy taught me everything I know, so. Um, well, again, we've got a ton of info for you guys today. Um, if you haven't noticed, we, we are uh, documenting this training. So thanks for accommodating the cameras, the lights. Um, we've got a ton of material. So we're gonna kind of present this to you guys in building blocks today. So some of it might be refresher of info that you already know and you're already dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But the goal for us is to basically say, hey, let us introduce ourselves and our company. Who are we? why we feel lithium is the strongest choice for a mobile power system and ultimately why Battleborn batteries is at the top of that, that pile that, that, you know, there's so many lithium batteries out there on the market now. And we're going to kind of work this towards, all right, what does it look like to install batteries into a system? What are the do's and don'ts for wiring both the batteries and a lot of these popular components up? And we'll, we'll, we'll do this in chunks. So we're not going to try and, present everything to you in one big burst. You know, so we'll, we'll do a chunk, we'll take a break. We'll do a chunk, we'll take a break. There's donuts and coffee back there. There'll be times that if you have questions, we'll, 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 we'll get through them all. Um, you know, if you have something pressing, you know, throw a hand up and we'll, 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 we'll get to it right away. Um, and again, we'll, we'll have time as we take our little intermissions and breaks to talk about any of this stuff um, that you may, may or may not know and hopefully give you a whole bunch of education today moving forward. So this kind of educational series, we're just calling the Battleborn Batteries Educational Series, building complete lithium power systems for RVs with a focus on lithium iron phosphate batteries. So a little bit again about what we're gonna talk about. So this first section before we get to the first break is gonna be an introduction with Lithium 101. Now this might be where you're kind of hearing things that you've heard before. This may be redundant information for you. But we're really trying to kind of drive home those main points about why we're selling lithium to our customers over the lead acid based batteries. And then we'll move into the different sections after we take a little break. So first and foremost, who is Dragonfly Energy? Everybody knows us by Battleborn Batteries, but who is Dragonfly Energy? So it's actually the tech company behind Battleborn Batteries. Dragonfly Energy is what we operate under. It's our corporation name. Battleborn Batteries is just one of our retail brands. So Dragonfly Energy as a whole is a lithium battery tech company. We do research down at the cellular level. You know, we've got a, a lab with a bunch of PhDs in there with white coats on, kind of doing the whole battery integration thing. But you know, that's not everything that who we are. We're just we got R&D, we've got a whole team of technical sales. We do all of our manufacturing right in Reno, Nevada. So we take our cells, we're building battery packs, we're a pack assembler in Reno, and then we support it out of Reno as well. That's kind of where we got to where we are today. It's been our technical customer support. Now you can buy a battery online from anybody these days on Amazon, but who are you gonna call when things start going south or you have a question on the system? You can call us if you bought Battleborn batteries and we'll help you out. So we're located in the USA. It's quickly becoming the lithium capital of North America. And we've got a few mines going in around us in Nevada that will eventually allow us to harvest lithium out of the ground from Nevada, build our own cells in Nevada, really kind of close that whole loop all the way through recycling. So a lot of new companies going in, you know, Redwood Materials is just down the road. They're a recycling company. Aqua Metals we work with as well, another recycling company. 
course, Tesla's there and Panasonic. So we're all kind of right in that little corner of Northern Nevada. And so this kind of breaks down our current brands. And I think what everyone will know best is right there in the middle, Battleborn. Now, I, I, don't, I know Airstream of Tampa is installing a lot of Battleborn batteries. By show of hands, who else is, is dealing with active lithium installs today? Anybody else in the room? So for a lot of you, this is, this is fairly new material. So that's, that's why we wanted to start with this, this 101 level and kind of show you who we are. So when we look at, all right, who, who's under our roof there in Reno? What are we doing? Well, again, Dragonfly and Battleborn is what you're going to see on the door. So like Brandon said, Dragonfly has always been our company name. That's, that's who we operate as. And we build different brands of batteries. So the two coming off of our assembly line right now are Dragonfly, which we sell specifically to OEM partners. And what you'll more than likely see a Dragonfly battery in is any Keystone RV product. So it's, it's been a very widely accepted battery through the Keystone range. Then we have Battleborn, that's our direct to consumer, that's our retail battery. So you're gonna find it online. You're gonna find it in a wide range of OEM offerings, Airstream, New Camp, Ember, to name just a couple that you'll find on a lot of RV lots. And then our, our newest brand is Wake Speed. And we'll absolutely touch on Wake Speed here later in, in today's presentation. This is an advanced alternator regulator. So we're finding more and more that we want um, a high output charging source under the hood of a vehicle. So for us, the intent is bumper to bumper solution. Essentially what we say is one throat to choke. So can we give you everything from one set of doors in Reno? Absolutely, if that's what you're looking for, we can provide it. And so as you step into that front door in Reno, this is kind of what you're greeted with. And for us, we operate in a 100,000 square foot facility, and there's about 170 employees that are employed by Dragonfly Energy now. So it's sort of a point of pride for us. When I started with the company, it was 20 employees in a 5,000 square foot warehouse. Uh, it was just about four and a half years ago. So you can see the, the, the growth for us has, has really accelerated quickly, and it's sort of come with that same rise as popularity in a lithium system. So as we've seen more adoption from the OEMs, we've seen a, a requirement for more batteries, greater number of batteries built every year. Now what comes with all those batteries is the need for folks like Brandon and I to support it. So there's a dozen of us that are on the phones five days a week in Nevada, answering questions, designing systems, making sure that we can support the, the products that we assemble there in house. So really one of the big keys for us in saying, well, who are we? Well, we're, we're a battery company that actually understands batteries. You know, and that goes a long ways because we can basically, like Brandon said, start from the cellular level, help you understand the battery, but more importantly, help you understand all the other bits and pieces that go along with it that you're going to need for a successful install. And that's where we'll get to today through this, this couple hours of training. So kind of the whole reason we've all come here today is comes back to the one question, why lithium? You know, why are we replacing all these lead based batteries with lithium ion batteries? You know, and everybody's a user of lithium batteries today, whether you like it or not, your cell phone, your, your laptop, your computers, your tablets, those all have lithium batteries for the same reason. They can go through a lot of cycles. They last a long time. They're lightweight. So you're all lithium users. Why not translate that over into your RV where you're also trying to be comfortable, live, run appliances, the same thing. So we like to use this chart as kind of our customer facing chart. This is something good that you can print out. You can have it at your sales desk. You know, when you're coming to like close a sale on an RV, you want to do an upsell. This is a good thing to point to. So just running through the categories here of what we're comparing. Depth of discharge. With lithium iron phosphate or Battleborn, you're going to get that full 100% depth of discharge. If you do fully drain a battery with a BMS, that BMS is just going to shut off the battery until you recharge it again. Lead acid in general, if you read the warranty, they're going to tell you not to discharge it below 50%. You've got that 50% discharge floor, so a single 100 amp hour battery, they really only want you to use about 50 amp hours. 
Sometimes you won't even get that under high loads due to the internal resistance. Battery life. The Battleborn batteries with the cylindrical cells, you're gonna get 3,000 to 5,000 cycles. How we landed at 3,000 cycles is that we did 3,000 full discharges at a 1C rate and then 3,000 recharges at a 0.5C rate, which is our max recommended recharge rate. And after 3,000 cycles, we had 80% capacity remaining. Now that full cycle in real life, you're not really ever gonna do that. You're never gonna go fully down to zero all the way back to 100 every single day. So you're more likely looking at 3,000 to 5,000 kind of partial cycles. With lead acid batteries, if you're nice to them, 500 to 1,200 cycles, maybe 1,600 cycles on a good AGM, then you're looking to replace them because you've got decreased capacity. So the weight's a huge thing, especially for like a small RV or someone trying to pull an RV with a Subaru or a small crossover. You know, getting that tongue weight down is, is crucial at this point. So in order to get a fully usable 100 amp hour batteries with the Battleborn, it's one battery, 31 pounds. This is a real battery here. You know, you can, you can throw it around. It's not heavy by any means. So 31 pounds on a single 100 amp hour battery. To get that calculated same usable capacity, you would need two lead acid batteries, about 144 pounds. So we're saving a lot of weight on the tongue just to get the same usable capacity. Self-discharge rate for storage, lithium iron phosphate, two to 3% per month. So it's really slow discharge. So for winter storage or long-term storage, just go ahead and utilize like a master disconnect switch to shut off the entire system from your batteries. Just let it sit. You'll get a slow drain on the batteries of two to 3% per month, but that's it. Lead-based batteries, it says an average of 33% per month. In reality, it's probably more like 15 to 33%, depending on the battery type, the temperature, at what state you store them at. Little variability there. Our Battleborn batteries, whether you buy them and pass it on to your customer or a customer buys them direct from our website, the 10 year warranty. That 10 year warranty is broken up into the first eight years as a manufacturer's warranty. So it's repair or replace, no questions asked. You know, we'll try and troubleshoot it with the customer or troubleshoot it with you to figure out what's going on. But if there's something wrong with that battery, we're gonna do what's right to get your customer back out on the road. Lead acid batteries, you know, if you're working with like interstate, for example, I mean, you can go through the warranty process and try and get a battery, but it's a pain usually. And usually the, just, the customer ends up just buying another battery. Customer support, lifelong with us. You can call us, you can ask us questions. If you get set up as a dealer with Battleborn batteries, you'll most likely get a direct contact. For example, these guys work with our, our internal guy named Ronnie. So you would get your own contact that you could fire off emails to get late night responses as we're up grinding away. So, you know, let us know and we can get you set up. And then battery protection, lead acid batteries, you don't really get much battery protection. You know, there's no battery management system. If you drop a wrench across the terminals of a lead acid battery, like you all have, you're welding, or you get a big spark. With the lithium iron phosphate batteries, we were the first to introduce short circuit protection in a BMS. So if you drop a wrench across our batteries, You'll get that one little spark, but the BMS will disconnect itself, only then reconnecting five seconds later once the short is removed. So drop a wrench, you're not welding, so it's a lot safer install. So this is kind of just a similar slide, putting some different graphics to what we just talked about. So lithium iron phosphate batteries, they will charge faster given the ability and a higher charge source. They have a very minimal internal resistance, so they will accept, gladly accept whatever your charge source has to offer. Lead acid batteries, they have a higher internal resistance, so there's a little bit of pushback and they don't as gladly accept that charge current. Um, again, kind of the same points on there, but the main thing is you're getting a heck of a lot more capacity in the same usable footprint. So you can either get your customer more capacity in the same footprint of their lead acid bank or you can get a really energy dense, high powered system in a smaller compact format. So ease of storage, I kind of touched on a little bit, just utilizing a master disconnect switch. It's that low self discharge rate of two to 3% per month that allows you to just flip a switch for winter storage, allow the batteries to rest, 
come back in the spring, turn the system on, you probably still have like 80, 85% capacity in it. Plug in, top them up, and you're ready to go. So for us, again, like, like we started off with, th there's going to be building blocks that we you know, continue to throw out there as we move towards a, a full system. So we moved from that why lithium idea to well, why Battleborn lithium? What makes us special when there's a brand new battery company that you go find on Amazon every month? You know, we, we've reached that point where it's widely accepted. It's like almost like how solar panels have gotten. You, you can find them from a wide range of suppliers. You can find them for a wide range of prices. So what makes us unique? So for us, we've been building batteries now for 11 years. So we think for a lithium battery company, we're, we're kind of one of the old dogs now. We've been doing this for a while. And if you think about where we've had to build our reputation, well, OEMs have only really been installing our batteries for the last two years. So prior to that, it's been DIYers. It's been the guys who are in the forums, online, figuring out how to do this themselves and, and make a lithium system work. So it's been good for us because we've learned a lot. They've taught us a lot. And honestly, they've beat the hell out of our batteries, which, you know, it's saying something. So at this point in the company's history, we probably have somewhere in the ballpark of about 300,000 batteries that have been built and are currently deployed out there in the world. So we take a lot of these new companies and we bunch them all together and they haven't built a fraction of what we currently have out there in the world. So for us, there's the history, you know, the, the, the fact that these have held up to DIY use. And, and when I mean DIY, it's guys who call in and go, you'll never guess what I just did. And again, that's, that's where we've had, you know, the short circuit protection. That's where we've had the guys that said, yeah, this thing fell off the end of the dock and we fished it out. Is it okay? And again, you know, it sounds like I'm, I'm telling tall tales here, but We've, we've heard anything you can imagine people have done to these batteries. So that's why we stand behind them. That's why we're so confident in what we build. And again, these are just a few of the photos that show what you're capable of doing with the batteries. Um, one of the other things that we're really proud of is the, the different charging sources, the wide range of use that you can use with these batteries. So anything from your traditional shore power charging source, I mean, we've worked with folks that are using wind power, water power, heavy duty alternators with external regulators. So the sky's the limit. It's really just a question of, hey, sir, ma'am, what do you want to do with the batteries? Let us help you design that. So that's ultimately what part of why Battleborn Batteries is. It's we can help both understand what the batteries will do and how to implement them into the system. So a couple things that really make the batteries unique for us, and it's basically how we build these batteries. It's, it's what we've engineered and what we've built from the ground up. So the first thing that makes a good battery, well, it's, it's the battery management system. How are we able to get you those three, four, 5,000 cycles? It's the fact that each and every one of these has an internal BMS, and that's the insurance policy for the power plant, for the cells of the battery itself. So Yes, we, we've looked at what can damage a lithium battery, and we've ultimately built those protections so that we, we can't shorten its life, we can't take away from its cycles. And so we'll, we'll touch on each of these protections and sort of what, we're, what we've developed, what we're giving you. And I think the first question that we always get from anybody, whether it's a dealer, an OEM, an end user customer, I should say it's more of a statement. It's, I hear that your batteries suck in the cold. Pretty blunt. Okay, well show me a battery that doesn't suck in the cold. Is it out there? I don't know if it necessarily is. So all batteries struggle when it's below freezing. So we've recognized that. What happens to our cells, what happens to any lithium cells if you allow them to charge in the cold is you'll start to form dendrites. Essentially think of these stalactites and stalagmites that build in the cell and they take away capacity. It's essentially metal plating, lithium metal plating in the cell itself. So we've built a protection that says, okay, we've got a temperature sensor that's wired directly to one of the cells of the battery. If the battery gets below 25 Fahrenheit inside, 
Again, not gonna happen on a day like today outside, but if you have a customer that's heading north for the off season, all right, what if? All right, we have that protection built in. Now, if they get below that temperature, that 25 Fahrenheit, the battery will still discharge. So you can continue to discharge down to negative four, and that's a dead stop for all charge and all discharge. So we've built those thresholds in to protect the cells. On the high end, we've got 135 Fahrenheit upper limit. So that means no charge and no discharge above that internal temperature on the battery. Again, it's gonna take a pretty special day to get you there. Could it happen in Vegas or Phoenix this time of year? Maybe. What happens if the cell is exposed to that extreme high heat as we start to see chemical breakdown? So that lithium iron phosphate will start to degrade and again, you'll lose capacity and you'll lose cycle life of the battery. So high and low protection built in, high and low voltage, and what we mean by that, so high voltage is essentially if we have an unregulated charge coming in. If we have a solar panel with a charge controller and that charge controller fails and we're getting high voltage coming straight in from the panel, the battery will not allow that high voltage acceptance. So anything higher than 14.6 volts, and we have a high voltage protection. For low voltage, what we mean there is if we drain the, the voltage so low and the battery shuts off, we're not gonna pull any extra power from the battery that could damage it. So that's gonna kick in at 10 and a half volts and it'll shut the battery, put it to sleep. Short circuit protection Brandon touched on. Again, that's if you know we have one of those days where we're butterfingers and we drop the wrench. We're not gonna damage that battery. The battery goes into a low voltage state. We can basically get that back online and wake it up by either removing the negative and breaking the circuit. That should get you an immediate return to online voltage or just apply a 12 volt source to the battery and it's awake again. So again, pretty easy to try and get these troubleshot and back to an online state. I think a couple of the things that we probably miss the most about what our BMS does so we do have some discharge limitations. So again, one of the things that we have to be aware of is that we can only pull so much power from these batteries, again, until we start to do damage to them. So for the 100, 100 amp hour battery, let's take that as our example here. Our BMS will allow for a 1C or 100 amp continuous discharge. You've got 200 amps for 30 seconds, so a bit of a boost. And then you've got a half second high surge, and that's typically gonna be in the range of about 350 amps. As we wire these batteries together in parallel, those numbers will increase. So two batteries, 200 continuous, 400 surge, so on and so forth. So the reason I point that out is we always have the question, well, can one of these batteries start my 4,000 watt generator? Well, typically if it's a single 100 amp battery, the answer is no, we need two batteries to give you the cold cranking amps to start that generator up. So there's always gonna be that formula to make sure that we've got the right battery bank for the required starting amperage needed for a high draw like that. Uh, last but not least, the term we use for our batteries is top balancing. So what does top balancing mean? That, that means that we need to apply a high voltage to the battery to get the BMS to start a passive balancing process for our cell packs. And I think as we get to the next slide, we'll kind of show that dissected look of what one of our 75 or 100 amp battery, battery packs looks like. And so, perfect transition there. We've got four modules or four cell packs. And what each of these are made up of is our 26650 cell. So the size of that cell, the way I was, you know, try to best describe it is think of a 12 gauge shotgun shell, you know, length and gauge, decent size. And we've got 30 of those that we weld into each individual pack. So the top balancing aspect of our BMS means that all four of those packs are gonna be evenly charged at the top of that charge cycle so that you have the healthiest battery possible and it can output the full capacity. Um, so that's, that's the BMS. That's a bunch of info, but again, we wanted to protect against all the external variables we could think of and make sure that, again, we're protecting the power plant, the cells of the battery. And for us, we've strategically chosen this cylindrical cell. So we're one of the few companies that are currently building lithium iron phosphate batteries 
that use a cylindrical cell, and we chose this strategically. The big reason for us is that when we build these modules, these cell packs, it leaves an air gap between the cells themselves, so the batteries can operate at the most efficient temperature possible, even if we're drawing a high load or we're charging under a heavy input. Um, so for us, safety is always the biggest concern. Those are the big reasons why we've designed the BMS like it is and why we've chosen the cylindrical cell. So a couple more things to touch on. So here, here's the two most popular cell types that you're gonna find in lithium batteries today. So cylindrical and prismatic, or essentially a pouch cell. So the big reason that you're seeing people use prismatic cells, it's cheaper, easier to build, and ultimately lighter weight. So what does that get you? It gets you a lithium battery that's slightly lighter than ours. It's gonna cost probably a couple hundred bucks less than ours, if not a little more. And it's easier for the manufacturer to pump these things out. Now, with everything that we can list as a pro for Prismatic, we have to consider the cons. And what are those cons? So sitting these pouch cells right next to each other means that they're effectively touching. So we don't have any air gap. We don't have any way to pull heat off of those cells under high charge or high discharge. So we always run the risk of high heat in a battery pack like that. Um, with these cells, they're very angular. So if we have a battery that's dropped, if we have something impact it, you run the risk of one of those cells becoming damaged or essentially leaking or bursting. So again, there, there's a higher failure rate on a prismatic cell than a cylindrical cell. And if you lose one of those cells, well, you don't just lose a small amount of capacity, you lose the whole pack. So it's an all or nothing sort of proposition when we talk prismatic. If we lose a single cylindrical cell in our battery, we lose a small amount of capacity, but we don't lose the entire module or the pack itself. So there's an advantage in that cylindrical cell in that we get a, a much better performance from the battery in terms of operating temperature and also it's I guess, risk of not becoming damaged if an event were to occur, such as a drop, you know, or an impact. All of our batteries have to go through UL testing. So they have actually all passed a three foot drop test. And that's what we have to have to have performed along with a number of other tests to get them to a point where they get that UL listing. So again, we've, we've beaten the hell out of these things just like a lot of the DIY customers have to make sure that they are gonna hold up for that 10 years plus that we give you guys. So kind of all that put together, you know, is a recipe for providing the cure for battery anxiety. Anyone who's been using an RV for the past 10, 15 years or longer, you've all ran out of battery power. You've gone completely dark when you didn't want it to. And you probably either started making phone calls or you were searching for a generator or a place to plug in. So what we think the cure for battery anxiety is, and we get that from a lithium iron phosphate battleborn bank, is they're gonna be maintenance free. You don't have to top them up with water. You, know, you don't have to do any careful storage practices. They're very easy to work with. We don't have a discharge floor, so you don't have to monitor or stop pulling power at any specific time. You can just set your set points on your inverter or your 12 volt load protect so that you can use almost all of the capacity of that bank if you use it all, it shuts off, you just have to recharge. Smart shunt monitoring, we put a star on there. Um, you can use any sort of shunt-based battery monitor. We like the Victron smart shunt or the BMV712. I mean, even in a lead acid system, if someone's still wondering if they want to transition to lithium, put a shunt or a battery monitor in that system so they can start learning their, their consumption, how much capacity they use. That's the one thing in the system that is gonna give the customer, the user, the information about how much power am I using and how much power am I putting back in, in, per in particular talking about solar. So any sort of battery monitoring is kind of crucial at this point, day and age. And most RVs are just coming with a battery monitor at this point. So the ability to get a quick recharge when you do fully discharge the battery bank that's nice. You know, there's a lot of converters coming out now that are 60, 80, 90, 100 amps. So you can recharge these batteries as quickly as possible. Fastest recharge time that we would want for our batteries is going to be two hours. And then tech support. 
You know, we get calls every day when people are out using their system. Hey, I just installed this high energy power system. I did it myself. I didn't test it. I brought my family with me to go test it on a week long trip. Nothing's working. We'll help them out. So then you start looking at, you know, why Battleborn batteries? And then you start looking at all the competitors, right? Now, we don't name out which competitors all of these are, but the things you want to start looking at and the things that your customers are going to be looking at when they go online is they're going to be looking at all these categories on the left-hand side. So a lot of these we've already just heard about us comparing lithium batteries to a lead-based battery, but looking at the depth of discharge is important. Our batteries, it's a full 100% depth of discharge. We claim these are a 100 amp hour battery. I know that when these are tested and they come off the line, BMS shutdown happens probably around 110, 114 amp hours consumed. So we are underrating our batteries, giving the customer even more capacity, and that's due to the high grade cell that we're at at this point. A lot of the other lithium, uh, lithium competitors, if you start reading their manuals or their data sheet, they only want you to use 80% of that battery. They don't tell you that up front but they want you to only use 80% of that battery because maybe their protection set points aren't giving a strong enough buffer where if you go below that, you risk completely de depleting each of those prismatic cells. So you also want to look at life cycles. You know, you can see life cycles ranging anywhere from 2,000 up to 6,000 cycles. How they're rating all that, I don't know. We put some thought behind it. Again, we did that 3,000 full discharges and recharges and that's how we ended up with our 10 year warranty and expected 80% capacity after those cycles. Weight's another big one. You know, a lot of the times we come in slightly heavier than those really cheap prismatics for the, from the competition, but that's kind of due to everything that we just talked about. We are using a stainless steel cylindrical cell. It's got a little bit more meat to it. Series compatibility, we can series up to 48 volts. A lot of the competition, the BMS that they designed it's not going to handle those higher voltages and they may have a breakdown of a MOSFET or a diode or whatever they're using in their BMS. So we have a, a very burly internal battery management system. It's completely overbuilt for what we're able to discharge out of our batteries, but we think ours blows the competition away. We have good surge capabilities on ours. The warranty of our battery, that says five year for some reason, but it is actually a 10 year warranty on our batteries. We have UL listings, you know, in order to be RVIA compliant to get into a lot of these OEMs, we had to go through that rigorous, expensive UL listing to list our entire battery pack. Most of the other companies out there, they'll just put the, uh, the cell listing on there and kind of roll it into, oh, we have a UL listed battery. That's not true. You can go buy UL listed cells online, build your own battery. That doesn't mean it's a UL listed battery, it just that means they have a UL listed cell. So we have UL listed cells, and the entire battery pack is also UL listed. So we're doing all our design and assembly here in the USA. There's a few other companies that are doing it as well, um, but we try to do everything in-house as we can. Again, we have about 170 employees working at Dragonfly Energy now, doing everything from tech support all the way down to research at the cellular level. Our customer service is based in the US. That allows us to have good quality control on the message that we're putting out. You know, we may all not give you the straight and narrow answer, but we all try and keep it relatively the same. Everyone's got a little different style on how you build a system. There's a lot of ways that you can kind of skin the cat. There's a couple ways to do it right and a lot of ways to do it wrong. And then battery core manufacturing focus. So again, as a company, Dragonfly Energy, we are a battery tech company. You know, we, we understand the batteries that we're building. Everyone else, they're just an importer of batteries. They're slapping a label on it. You can look at all the batteries that are on Amazon now. They all look the same. It's the exact same case, the exact same lid, same little slide-in strap holder. You know exactly where they're all coming from, and that's the same manufacturer overseas. So we're here to primarily talk about RVs, but what we've found is that our battery is suitable for so much more than just RVs. Um, you, you know, again, RV, van, marine, th those are kind of the big markets for us right now, but we're seeing some 
emerging markets. And again, they, they may be something that you could capture some business from with your service centers. So heavy duty trucks, work trucks, fleet vehicles. Again, we're, we're constantly evolving our electronics that we have in our vehicles and it requires more, more power. Um, so essentially we've found that there's so much more that these batteries can do. So something you can keep in mind, if you have somebody that has an idea for power, call us. We've probably heard about it before and can help you with that system design. So we've got a few dummy batteries. We've got one built battery pack here. We'll kind of quickly run through the different battery options that we build today. And so I, I think what our flagship battery, what everybody probably knows best is, you know, going to be that group 31 battery. So BB10012, or we call it the 112 meaning a 12 volt, 100 amp hour capacity battery. So this, this is the flagship battery. This is sort of what we envision first and foremost for us to build. And with most of our models, we're following that traditional BCI battery group size. A lot of people ask, well, why build two 12 volt, 100 amp batteries? Again, when we started this company, we wanted to build the two most popular lead acid battery sizes on the market. So that's the group 31, and that six volt golf cart battery. So the GC2 mimics that footprint of the six volt golf cart battery. Again, you'll, you'll sell this to more Airstream owners than anybody else. And we have a couple folks that can test to that. Um, it also just gives us a second option if we've got a unique space in an RV that maybe this battery doesn't fit in. So those are the two 12 volt 100 amp options. We've also got a group 24 option that you see here. So really just an inch and three quarters less as far as the length goes. And we build this in both a 50 and 75 amp capacity. So somebody with a small travel trailer, somebody that's looking to use maybe a small 12 volt trolling motor or a couple of these in series for a 24 or 36 volt trolling motor. Again, we've, we've got a ton of different options for that battery as well. We move into our larger capacity batteries. So the Game Changer GC3 here is one example of the two. This is the one battery that we build that doesn't meet any preconceived battery size. Um, we let our engineers kind of run wild with this at the request of an OEM. What I really love about this battery, and, and really this is true with any of our batteries, is you can mount these on five of the six external facing sides. So get creative with the space that you have. If you've got a wardrobe, you know, stand it upright. If you can lay this in a dinette seat or under a bed, put one of these, put two of these tall and take advantage of some wasted space. So with a completely sealed cell, with a sealed design, again, any of these batteries can install in any orientation. You just have to secure it in place to make sure that everything's safe and good to go down the road. Um, the sort of sibling battery to this in a 270 capacity is the 8D. So again, a pretty well-known size. We don't have an example here, but that 8D you're gonna find most often in sailboats. You're gonna see it in some bigger class A's with a pull-out battery tray at the front of the coach. And then last but not least, the one I skipped over is our 24 volt battery. Also in this group 31 size. So higher voltage battery, we see it employed a lot for maybe a single 24 volt trolling motor option, or maybe for somebody that wants to, to put in that 24 or 48 volt small off-grid system for a cabin or a small home. So one of the things that we look at is sticker shock. Let's, you know, let's not lie. There is a price to pay. You know, you pay to play with lithium. And again, it doesn't make sense for every customer out there. You, you know, we don't want to sell this battery to somebody who travels from RV park to RV park. There, there's just really not that, you know, not that need from that, that kind of customer. So this is going to make sense to somebody who spends some time off grid. You know, they need a battery that's going to give them reliable power, especially when we have hot, humid days like this. They want AC, they want fans, they want their creature comforts. So what this slide talks about is it talks about, well, the cost of a lithium battery versus a lead acid battery. And 
this is the way to kind of break down and dissect how much you're paying per kWh, per kilowatt hour. And so what we look at on this slide, and we won't bore you with the details, is we essentially did some testing and we took a whole range of batteries. We've got a full white paper that's online that you can read through if you really wanna get into the weeds on battery testing. But what we're saying is that this is the cheapest battery you'll ever buy. So if you're cycling this battery compared to a lead acid battery, you're gonna get more per cycle or more per kilowatt hour out of this battery than you will for anything else that we've tested, whether it be a flooded or an AGM. And that's by basically counting the amount of kilowatt hours, the amount of cycles that you can get out of one of these batteries for the cost. So that's essentially what we're trying to show here. We've done different testing at different depths of the discharge to show you how many cycles you'll actually get out of this battery. So for the example here at a 50% depth of discharge, so take it down to 50, charge it back up. Our battery is gonna be nine cents per kilowatt hour. Essentially what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a battery that will give you about 12,000 cycles versus a lead acid that might give you 800 on its best day. So that's ultimately what we're trying to pass on there. Give you these. So we make every battery that we have in a heated battery option. You know, it'd be a different SKU that you'd be ordering at the time. You're just throwing an H on the end of that SKU. So the SKU for this battery in particular is BB112. The heated version would be BB112H. So why the heck would we have a heated battery? Well, our BMS is gonna stop that battery from accepting a charge once it gets below 25 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we've got customers that wanna go out west, they wanna go skiing, they wanna use that RV when it's cold in the winter, maybe that battery is exposed to some cold environments, we still want that battery to be able to accept a charge. So we've built a heated battery that essentially just has some PTC heat strips wrapped around the cell with some protection in there. So the battery will actually warm and maintain itself between a temperature band of 35 degrees Fahrenheit and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And it will duty cycle within that temperature range, turning the heat circuit on to warm up, off to cool, on to warm up, and we can kind of estimate how often that is going to cycle. And it's all based on ambient temperature and the amount of insulation that you put around it. So this graph here kind of shows the operation of that heated, heated battery. When the heater is on, it's about a two amp draw on our 100 amp hour battery. So it does use its own power to keep itself warm. But the only reason you're going to heat our batteries is to charge it. So as long as you have a charging source that is greater than that two amps going into the battery, you're able to offset it to continue getting a net charge on the batteries. So the batteries just aren't consuming themselves, keeping themselves for no reason. So we can assume how often that heat on cycle is, and it's all dependent on ambient temperature, insulation, you know, it's basically heat in and heat out. So if we go ahead and put insulation around the batteries to capture that heat that is generated by that heat strip, we're really able to minimize the amount of time that the battery needs to heat itself, keeping it in that kind of cool down range by capturing that heat generated. There's a linear relationship between ambient temperature outside and how often the heater actually stays on. So for this test, we've used some low E insulation, which it's just Reflectix, that reflective bubble wrap stuff that you can get. And I put this in an aluminum enclosure, an enclosure that you kind of find on the side of the road where you've got a pole with a solar panel on top, aluminum enclosure, and inside of that is a battery powering a light or a street sign or something. So that was kind of the test bed for us to test the heated battery with insulation. We insulated that metal compartment so we could watch the heat being captured from this heated battery. And as we got colder, of course, the heater stayed on longer. Now, without any insulation, our battery will only effectively keep itself warm down to about zero degrees Fahrenheit. But with just that reflective bubble wrap, we were able to get down to about negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit before the battery heater could no longer effectively warm itself above that 25 degree Fahrenheit threshold. And the insulation used, again, real thin reflective bubble wrap 
If you put some good pink R6 foam in there or something like that, we can get even colder. So we've tested these in really cold environments. This is the perfect solution for that customer who's gonna go up to Alaska, go into the mountain skiing. You can set them up with success. So that kind of gets through our whole Lithium 101, just general basics about the company, who we are, why Lithium. If you wanna stand up, take a break, grab a donut, we can resume in about 10 minutes and be a good time to ask questions too if you have any. So now we can kind of start identifying the different components that you might be putting into these high energy power systems. Um, you know, we got a table full of a couple of the brands that we sell, Victron, Precision Circuits. Um, there's a lot of them out there. There's a couple that we really like, and then there's some other ones that we don't like so much that we, we won't talk about. So in general, when you're going through and designing these higher energy systems or you're identifying components that are put into an OEM factory system, it really comes down to looking at charging sources. You know, with, with lithium batteries or any other battery type, how you charge them is very important. So you can start breaking down where your charge source is coming from and what type of component are you looking for in the system. So shore power or generator charging, whether it's through a transfer switch or not, you're gonna be looking at an inverter charger or your basic converter in a power center or a standalone converter. From solar, you got your panels on the roof, you got a solar charge controller to regulate it. Every solar charge controller is rated for a certain amount of amperage output, which does translate to how much solar you have on the roof. We can talk about that in a little bit. Alternator charging in a motorhome, a little bit more crucial. You know, you might be used to seeing the white version of this BIM here. You can straight swap them over to the lithium version, or you can use a DC to DC charger. But that alternator charging is more a motorhome related thing. You know, travel trailers through the seven pin, you get a trickle charge and that's fine. As long as the customer unplugs from where, when they get to where they're going, they can go on like that. But nowadays people are starting to put in DC to DC chargers to drape from the tow vehicle back to the trailer to actually get a better charge when you're driving around the road. That's becoming a lot more popular, so we'll talk about that. And then in the really advanced, like Sprinter vans that you see coming out from the OEMs or aftermarket, second alternators, regulator, they do make alternators now that can pump out 8,000 watts continuous, like from Nations, the 48 volt versions. So having an advanced regulator for an alternator like that is paramount. You absolutely need to do it safely when you're pumping that much energy. So once you've got all your charging sources lined up, you always wanna have ways to monitor it, whether it's simple shunt-based battery monitors or the fancy touch screens for an all-in-one Victron system. Having a good way for the customer to understand their consumption, whether it's uh, state of charge, knowing their current, watching the graphic on the touch screen so they can see the power flowing from their panels. They wanna be able to see something so they understand how much power they have left before they go to bed. Then there's other miscellaneous components in the system like a soft start. Uh, we did not bring a soft start or an easy start, but if your customer wants to run an air conditioner off an inverted system, put that soft start on there to replace the start capacitor so you don't get that heavy hitting compressor hit right when you turn it on you want it to build and slowly ramp up that compressor for an allowable kind of power draw from the inverter. A lot of those good inverters, like the transformer-based inverters that can handle that high surge capacity, they may start and run that compressor for a while, but as the compressor ages out and maybe demands a little bit more current, eventually it's not gonna work in the system. So, you know, we've partnered with a lot of different brands in the RV industry or in the, the stationary markets as well. For the mobile power systems, Victron Energy, you know, we pushed a lot of Victron Energy into the OEM space, which is why you kind of see it now. We're North America's number one distributor of Victron Energy. And because Victron doesn't really have that direct technical support line, we are the Victron technical support line when you buy Victron from us. You kind of always have to go back to your distributor. If you're looking to source Victron, I recommend doing it from us because we are very knowledgeable in the programming, the settings, the applications that are used for any of this Victron stuff. So just give us a call and we can set you up. Progressive dynamics for converters. 
We've been working with them longer than we worked with WIFCO. Progressive Dynamics came out with that good lithium replacement a heck of a lot longer before WIFCO did. Now WIFCO is revising and fine tuning that auto detect version that they have. Um, so that's working a lot better now as well. Yes. What's that? There's a secret to it. You have to put it in the lithium setting. No, 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 no. The auto detect? Yep. If you just hook it up, it will not detect those batteries. Mm -hmm. Hook it up, turn the 110 power off to your converter. Yep. yep. Let it draw down to about 13 volts, turn it back on, bam, it knows it's lithium. Otherwise, you got to look for the blue light. And unfortunately, the light is in the back of the box, but you got to watch for the light to go from green to blue. Yeah. Yep. Red Arc's a new one for us. Um, we brought on Red Arc actually only a couple weeks ago. So Red Arc is extremely popular in the overlanding computer or overlanding community. They're an Australian-based company. Those guys have been overlanding, four-wheeling, camping, call it whatever you want, for a really long time. They make a lot of really good components. In particular, I really like their DC to DC chargers. They're completely potted and waterproof. So if you're doing like a four x four or a truck camper, you can mount that Red Arc DC to DC charger right up on the, by your radiator. It can be completely exposed. I mean, you can dunk these things in a bucket of water and watch them still charge. They're pretty good components. Um, we use micro air for the easy starts. You can also use the RV soft start. More important that you just have some sort of soft start in there for the air conditioner that you want to run. Which brand you use, it doesn't really matter. They're all, they're all good. Rich Solar was a solar panel company that we brought on maybe a year and a half ago. Panels are relatively all the same when you kind of start looking at Rich Solar, Renogy, New Power. You know, they're all very similar in their build. They all have that same aluminum frame. We liked Rich Solar because they would pick up our phone calls and they would pick up our customer phone calls. So if you guys are looking to source some panels, I'd recommend Rich Solar or New Power. We finally brought them on as well. They make a lot of solar panels in a lot of other markets that we use. Like they make the class one div two stationary panels that you might find on like an oil pipeline. Um, so they're in a lot more markets than just RV as well. And then Merlin Solar. You know, they make the best flexible panel that's out there, bar none. You know, you, they have all the videos where they're shooting them with a Glock and they're still, you know, performing at just decreased output. So they've become very popular. I do believe Airstream is putting on Merlins from the factory. Yep. Try to get them on the phone. Oh, well, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> they make a great panel. Yeah. So really, as we talk about what we're going to find in the RV, we want to make sure that, well, we, we approach what we're looking to do in the RV. And so this will continue to lead us down a path of how we envision the RV power system for the customer. And a lot of it for us is asking that introductory question, what the heck do you want to do? You know, do you just need slightly more power? Do you want less maintenance of your batteries? Do you want to, you know, erase the stock system and put in, put in something custom? Do you have a specific requirement? And so by kind of asking these probing questions, it then leads us to, all right, well, I need to understand that we're approaching this and looking at power in two separate electrical systems in the RV. So we've got our, our 12 volt and our 120 side. and as we understand what the customer wants, we can then start to plan what that system is gonna look like, and what some of those individual component replacements are gonna be. So for us, we just you know really wanted to kind of list out some of those common requests that we get and what you'll likely get. And you know, I, I think it can start from the basic of, I just want my creature comforts to be powered better. My 12 volt fans, my lights, my 12 volt fridge, my water pump, you know, just give me a, a better performing system and we'll get folks that will absolutely pivot from that and go, well, I've got two rooftop air conditioners and a residential fridge and two CPAPs and, you know, spare no expense. I need this thing to run day and night. So we want to try and give you, you know, the understanding of, all right, well, here's what we need to power and, and here are the different paths that we have to take to create a system to power that. 
So we'll start with the easy stuff. And, and again, I don't think this will be anything more than just review for everybody. Converter chargers. So it's really identifying and qualifying that converter charger. So I think you're going to see on a lot of these slides, we'll list our recommended charge profile. And we haven't touched on this yet. So for us, we, we, we've put a three-stage charge profile up here. So essentially bulk and absorption, 14.2 to 14.6. So here's your key number to remember. We need a charging source that hits that voltage. Again, we'll go back to the BMS. That's where the passive cell balancing is going to occur. So we need to get that from at least one of our charging sources. Float, 13.4 to 13.8 volts. We try to offer a pretty wide range there so we can qualify the highest number of chargers possible for use. And then equalization can either be fully disabled or set to mimic that bulk and absorption number so we have a safe voltage that comes into the battery. Uh, the, the one thing that isn't put here as sort of a, a side note is if we've got a temperature compensation that's part of the charge process, we want to try and disable that as well. Lithium batteries need no temperature compensation. We've got that, again, built into the BMS so that if we hit too high or too low, that protection kicks in. But essentially, that's what we're looking for in every converter charger that we check. So whether it's a, uh, a wall mount, a full power, power center, or a deck mount, we're able to look at the voltage that that can output, and we can either validate it or we can find a replacement. Uh, so again, converter charger is pretty easy. I think the, the second most common charging source that we're seeing on almost every RV on a lot now is you're gonna see more than likely a single or maybe two solar panels installed. And you'll see them you know, really offered in a range. So flexible panels like we talked about from folks like Merlin Solar or New Power, a lot of portable panel options now. And again, this makes sense to us. Go park in the shade, throw a panel out that you can adjust through the day and use that as a charging source. All the way to filling the roof with fixed panels if you want to really create that off-grid power plant, be able to run those air conditioners all day without a thought of how am I going to recharge these things, you know, to continue to operate. Really the, the combination of the solar panel and the solar charge controller, we go through that same qualification process. It's checking the manual or checking the output on the charge controller itself. So I think we've shown, you know, a lot of the popular options that you'll find coming both from an OEM side and also chosen from the aftermarket side. So we've got the GoPower, you know, just their, their 30 amp PWM. We've got the Zamp Solar on the other side, Victron's 30 amp option. And then as Brandon mentioned, the Red Arc. And what's great about a lot of those Red Arcs is they offer the BC-DC, which will do both DC to DC and solar charge MPPT option as an all-in-one. Um, so whatever it ends up being, we're just looking to validate that charge profile. Um, I think the other thing that we'll touch on, and we'll get into this later, is we, we try to have a formula. If we really have someone who truly wants to be off grid, there's that combination of how much solar do I need per battery. So for us, for each 100 amp battery, we want a minimum of 200 watts of solar. We can put more, great. Nobody's gonna complain about having a higher charge rate or the ability to charge their batteries up faster from solar. Um, this slide just shows an example of what you'll see for a lot of the popular solar controllers out on the market. So if we take Victron, for example, we've got a 100 slash 30. You've got two ways to program this. On the bottom, you've actually got a real small potentiometer that is numbered. And those numbers should line up with all these battery profiles. So we go down the list, we find number seven on the bottom of this Victron, and we know that it's gonna give us 14.2 for bulk and absorption, 13.5 for float. So this qualifies just by taking a flathead, turning it to number seven, and knowing it'll fully charge a lithium battery. What's great about this particular charger is it also is Bluetooth compatible. So we can easily pull a phone out, we can connect to this, and we can do a custom charge profile as well. So our preference is always gonna be that custom profile just because we can better you know, select those voltages and we can account for any potential voltage drop that occurs from charge controller to batteries. 
and just better control what the customer is going to get. So again, it's just going through, understanding the product, understanding that we have a number of different options. So if somebody comes to you and says, well, I want that, but for AGMs, for flooded lead acid, we can go down the list and find whatever's right for the customer at the end of the day. So I kind of mentioned seven pin charging earlier for alternator charging on a travel trailer. You know, all of them are set up with some sort of 12 volt auxiliary charge port, which laser right there. You know, if it's a four pin, you're not gonna have it, but the seven pins all do. You can gain that three to five amp trickle charge when you're driving down the road. You know, there's enough voltage gradient coming off of the higher voltage of the alternator to the voltage of the lithium that you'll get some sort of trickle charge through there. Maybe it's enough to keep your 12 volt refrigerator running. Maybe it's not, but you're getting something across that. You do not need to alter that charging source. You can pull the pin on the truck to just disable it completely. You know, if you don't want to have to worry about unplugging the seven pin when you stop everywhere you go, because technically it's paralleling your lead acid starter battery to your lithium bank in the trailer, you can always pull the fuse in the truck to just eliminate that charge source altogether, but it's not required. Nowadays, people are switching to the DC to DC chargers, like the Victron Orion, or maybe that Red Arc DC to DC charger. So they're actually gonna take an input into the DC to DC charger from the tow vehicle. They're probably using like a six gauge Anderson quick disconnect at the hitch of the vehicle just to make that quick disconnect on there. And then they're gonna run the output of this to their new lithium bank. Again, not required, but this is starting to become a more popular option because people are wanting to use more and more things in their RV. So any charging source that you can get when you're driving down the road is beneficial to the customer. So again, DC to DC chargers, they come in all different shapes and sizes. That 30 amp from Victron tends to be our most popular option, again, because it's got that Bluetooth control on it. The Victron Orion is actually the one Victron component that will not integrate into the all-in-one kind of system monitoring with the Serbo GX and the touchscreen. You can't hook that up to anything else. You can't do any smart networking to anything else. It just does its own thing, and that's okay. You can get the monitoring of the charge through that, through your smart shunt or your, your battery monitor. So the Orion TR Smart, it does come in an isolated and a non-isolated version. We have a slide that explains the grounding between those two. Um, you can wire any DC to DC charger, typically up to like an ignition signal. The Orions will operate without an ignition signal. All they do is wait to see that input voltage raised to a certain threshold. Then it will start charging. And then when you shut the vehicle off and that the input voltage drops back down to a normal lead acid level, like 12.8 on a starter battery, it'll just stop charging. But you can rig them up with an ignition wire. So if you put 12 volts to the H pin on here, it will automatically turn on and automatically turn off as you turn the key on and off in the truck. So it's a lot of different options. Most people just run with the factory default of operating off of the input voltage. Just eliminates one wire for you to hook up. Victron's bigger option is the Buck Boost. We mainly use that one in the 50 amp and the 100 amp version, but they do have a smaller 25 amp. They're all non-isolated, which means it requires that common ground. I don't really like to use the non-isolated ones when you're doing a tow vehicle to a trailer operation, but non-isolated does work really well in a motorhome when everything is grounded to that common 12 volt chassis. So the Buck Boost, the 100 amp version, you get a solid 100 amp output on that one. Programming of the Buck Boost, it's not Bluetooth. They've been talking about coming out with a Bluetooth version for a long time now. Hopefully we'll see that at the start of next year. But programming a Buck Boost right now, you actually have to get that kind of old school style printer cable, which I think it's like USB-B to USB-C, the old square cutoff corner printer style cable. You hook it up to your laptop and then you run was it TS Config? TS Config, yep. There's a program called TS Config that you download online for free. You're just plugging in voltage values. It's actually such a smart converter that it will only start charging once it senses a certain vibration from the idle of the vehicle. 
You can turn that on or off, but on default it's on. So once it starts feeling the rumbling of the engine, it will start charging. The red arcs are both a DC to DC charger and a solar charge controller, or at least most of them are. So they've got a 50 amp, a 40 amp, a 25 amp, and then now a little 12 amp from, uh, for seven pin charging. They came out with the 40 amp strictly due to the, uh, the sprinter limitations on the OEM sprinter options. If you read the manual from Mercedes-Benz, they tell you not to charge an auxiliary bank with more than 40 amps. I've actually recently heard that for 2023, they're bumping that up to 60 or 80. So there's some leeway on putting on a larger DC to DC charger without voiding the warranty. But up until now, 40 amp was the limitation. So most people were putting in a 40 amp red arc or a 30 amp DC to DC charger. How you program the red arc, it's not through Bluetooth. There's no graphic user interface. There's just two wires, a green and an orange. You short them together, tie them off, put some heat shrink on it, you're in lithium mode. Undo them, you're back to lead acid. So pretty easy for you to install, easy for the customer to install. I haven't had a problem with one yet. Then you get into the really high energy alternator charging and you start talking about wake speed. So wake speed is actually a company that we acquired maybe a year ago. You know, they, they're kind of the direct competitor to Balmar in the marine market for high energy alternator regulators. What wake speed does differently compared to like Balmar and the other common regulators on the market is this will charge based on voltage and current. So getting that current in there allows you to really kind of press how much current you're going to put into that battery bank because this knows how much current is going into the battery bank. If you look at a Balmar external regulator, all that's doing is sensing its output voltage and it's driving the alternator based on that. This is driving the alternator based on voltage and current. So we can really push the limits of how fast we can recharge a lithium battery bank. If it's a closed loop communication system where you have like a smart BMS that is talking to this, you can walk a very fine line and ensure that you're never gonna run into a situation where the BMS opens. We'll have smart batteries this fall, so we'll be able to operate on that type of system. So this got a bunch of hookups on it. There's a, a harness port on here, which is this harness right here. And then there's a couple RJ45 jacks. So wake speed is the only other component from Victron that you're able to see up on the touchscreen. No other component has penetrated into the Victron system to be able to view information about a component outside of Victron on a touchscreen. It does not yet show up on that front interface screen where you're like watching the solar come in or the inner inverter charger. Eventually we will and we'll have our logo up on that front screen so you can actually just see charging from the alternator on that graphic user interface. Right now you can go into the menu, go to the device list, look at the information from the wake speed. At this time, this is just pushing data to that system. So you can read voltage, current, the state that this thing's in. But that's a good first step for us to be able to integrate even deeper with Victron. So the harness, I think we got a slide on that. I think we've got quite a few at the end. But. Okay. So we'll get into the harness a little bit later when we talk about wiring that one up. But if you're looking for a high energy charge system on like a Sprinter or a motorhome, look at the wake speed regulator, probably paired up with like a nation's alternator. You can either get a kit from them or you can source it from us. They do 12, 24 and 48 volt systems. So getting into battery monitors, again, we, we've got a few different options, um, all shunt based battery monitors. So we've got two here, for example, these are, again, our two most popular that we sell. And really the only difference is how do you want that information delivered to you or to the end user? Is it Bluetooth? Is it Bluetooth with a display? Or is it just a display? So probably best known that you're gonna see in a lot of OEMs is the BMV. So 700, 702, 712. Again, the only difference there is how is that info gonna be translated to you? Is it just the two inch digital display? or is it the 712 with the display in Bluetooth? As we bump to the smart shunt, we've got the smart shunt available in 500, 1000, and 2000 amp versions. 
I think the 500 amp for mobile power system is what we're going to see most. Bluetooth only, so it's all going to send to a connected device. And, and really, those are our two options there. Uh, the Link Shunt, which can be used as part of the, the Link's distributor, power in and shunt kind of family of products. Um, that's where, again, we're going to get that, that higher end system. We're going to have the servo, we're going to have the touch screen, and we're going to have something that gives uh, a little bit more info directly to that touch screen from the display itself. So no physical display, just communication cable straight to your servo and the touch screen directly. I think we've touched on the MicroAir Easy Start quite a bit. Again, just something that we want to use whenever we know that air conditioning is going to be part of the system, whether it's straight from a battery bank and inverter or a small generator. Uh, I believe MicroAir says that this unit can power an air conditioner of 15K BTU off a generator as small as 2000 watts. So it's just a really versatile option that really lessens the demand of the system as a whole. So this is sort of getting into to a little bit bigger meat and potatoes part of the, the presentation. Um, we've got one of the multi pluses here, but Really, we wanted to touch on the Victron product and the Victron inverters because we're starting to see more and more popularity with these. There's a lot of options. And what we really have to look at is the coach as a whole. Are we specking an inverter for a 30 or 50 amp coach? And that's ultimately what we're starting to dissect and decipher here is that we can look at the Multi Plus, we can look at the Multi Plus 2 with two hot conductors for both input and output. And we can find options that are gonna work for a pretty wide variety of coaches on the road. So whether it's a single inverter, whether it's dual inverters that we're putting in parallel or split phase, with Victron, we've got an option for that. So we wanted to kind of just run through a few of the, the, the features that the Victron will offer, show how that looks in terms of wiring. Um, we, we, we don't want these to feel intimidating, and I don't think they should. You, you know, they're, they're pretty, pretty well labeled, pretty, pretty easy to decipher with AC input, AC output, and DC connection. Um, what's nice is they're fully programmable, so you can use them for really any battery type. Um, and you've got numerous ways to monitor the info that these, you know, all, all the data that these can provide you. So you can see all the true AC input and output stats it will give you some information as far as the connected DC uh, battery voltage and current as well. Um, so what else do they do? One of the great things about these is hybrid functionality. So I think the, the scenario that we envision is if you're, we'll call it mooch docking is the term I think we use, and you're plugged into a 15 amp outlet, but you wanna run the air conditioner and the residential fridge, well, you can take that 15 amps and pass it through. If that's not enough for what the RV demand is, you're gonna have that hybrid functionality and some power assist where it'll draw that additional power from the battery bank itself. So it's a pretty intelligent, you know, pretty intelligent inverter where it can essentially take anything that you make available for it, prioritize the pass through, and then use that excess power from the battery bank itself. Um, Internal UPS, so if for some reason you have a power outage, you lose that 120 source, the generator runs out of gas, those critical loads will continue to run, switch directly over to battery power, and keep everybody in the RV happy. So a number of different remote and monitoring devices, we'll run through these quick, and again, it's all just a matter of how you want that info displayed and shared with you. So VE bus smart dongle is basically just a cat six connection in the end that runs directly and plugs into one of the two ports in the inverter itself. You've got your green connection here and you're gonna go B plus and B minus to provide this thing with some 12 volt power. And this will Bluetooth enable that, that inverter. So pull up a phone, pull up a tablet and you've got full remote control function and the ability to monitor. If you want something that's a little bit more of an old school analog, the, the digital multi-control is gonna be your true hardwired panel 
that you can put in the living space of the RV. It's got a physical on off flip switch. It's got the ability to turn the knob to select the AC input current limit so that you can draw whatever size or whatever amount of current from the circuit or from the generators available. And you've got the full display of LED lights that would normally show up on the front of the inverter itself. Last but not least, and I know we've touched on it a few times, is you can hardwire the inverter directly to the servo. So it's feeding all the info into this monitoring hub and have everything then display on the touch screen in the living space of the RV. So quite a few different options. And this just kind of shows the, I guess we'll call it the complexity or the, the, the integration of the servo itself. So we really, you know, touch on this. If you want someone that wants a full Victron system, they want full system monitoring, this can accept anything from inverter, battery monitor, solar charge controller. This has a, a whole number of tank sensors on the bottom. We can set up auto gen start relays. So, you know, the sky's kind of the limit with this particular box, depending on what the customer wants. And it can go as far as, again, integrating with a five or seven inch touch screen. Um, what am I missing? This, this has Bluetooth capability, but the only thing that you can do via Bluetooth on a servo is hook this thing up to the Wi-Fi that's present. So Bluetooth on that component's extremely limited, but it can get you onto the Wi-Fi based one that allows you to do some remote management. And so here's just sort of a taste of what that interface or that management looks like. So we keep talking about the Bluetooth function of a lot of these products. That's all gonna be accessible through Victron Connect. So when you pull that app up, you're gonna have a device list where it'll give you some quick stats on the device itself. And then through just the touch of a button on your phone screen, you get into a full interface of that particular device. This is great for monitoring. You can go through and do all your programming of the devices via the app itself. Uh, you can even update firmware by just the touch of a button as well. Uh, so Victron Remote Monitoring or VRM is a further step in. So with the Servo, if you give this an active Bluetooth connection, you now have the ability to pull up VRM on the phone and you don't have to be in that, that 30 to 40 foot range via a Bluetooth local network. You can actually step back and be really anywhere in the world if this has active internet and look in on the system. So it can give you that same remote control access, that same programming ability. So we find it a, a really valuable tool. If we have a customer who has internet that's enabled in the, uh, in the RV, we can log into their VRM or they can grant us access and we can do all the programming and firmware updates from our desk in the office straight through their system. So very handy if you want to do some remote tech support. One last uh, kind of sidebar that we'll touch on that Victron offers is they offer a toolkit app. Now the toolkit app is handy if you have to do that troubleshooting. What it gives you is it gives you the ability to go through and select a number of different uh, components. From there, you can select the different uh, lighted codes that the component might give you. So for us, we'll see with eight LEDs on the front of the inverter, a number of different lighted codes. This can go in and help you decipher what that code actually means. So this is a really handy app to have. If somebody calls up and says, yeah, my inverter's acting funny, I've got these lights flashing or these lights solid, it then allows you to go through, decipher that code, and it gives some explanation to sort of continue to troubleshoot and diagnose the problem. Um, short of that, there, there's some cable calculation tools in there, um, but we really use it just for the troubleshooting. Yeah, I think we see, we see people call in with light questions on the solar charge controllers more. You know, if you sell someone a Victron solar charge controller, they do the wiring themselves, they wire all their panels up together. Whoops, I wired them all in series you'll get light codes flashing on the solar charge controller that indicate PV high voltage or over voltage. That's when we get the phone call and we can pull out this app because the lights will blink a specific color if you get over voltage, battery over voltage, PV over voltage, over, you know, over current. 
actually, there's no overcurrent one. You just break the controller at that point. But um, that's what it's useful for. So that was just kind of very high level Victron components. If you guys have questions about the Victron components, we can do it now. We will kind of dive into more about wiring up these components, integrating them into a system, bus bar. But if you have any Victron related stuff, programming, that would be a good time. All right, we'll move into sort of the next, the next phase here. So um, I'll keep coming back to it. Like I said, we're, we're, we're looking to build blocks here, step by step. So, you know, we, we've talked about lithium batteries, we've talked about Battleborn, we've gone through components. Awesome. How do we, how do we install them? Not only how do we install them, but how do we do it successfully, do it the right way? You know, for us, it's do it once, do it right. We don't want that customer calling us in six months going, what's wrong? Why is this not working? So for us, the, the hope in this next section is to kind of go through a lot of the, the do's and don'ts of installing this equipment, making sure that we've got a good understanding that whether we go down the road of keep it simple, hey, I've got a couple batteries and a lead acid converter and just a stock solar charge controller all right, well, let's, let's make that simple upgrade, something you can, t you can tackle in a couple hours and send the customer down the road knowing it's going to work. Or are we going to do that system overhaul to power it all? Are we going to get them full air conditioning, full CPAP, full residential fridge, and give them a multitude of charging sources? So this is going to take us down both paths. Um, we'll start with that more simple system and just kind of talk about the the primary do's and don'ts. And again, we, we, we keep coming back to those main questions, you know, and we're really going to learn the most by asking those couple probing questions. What do you want to do? do? Do you just need more usable power? Do you just need a battery that has less overall maintenance and something that's going to last you for a lot longer period of time? Do you have some special requirements? Do you travel with a pet and you want to step away from the RV for a couple hours and make sure that the pet is comfortable and safe? Do you need a CPAP to run overnight to keep you comfortable? So it's, it's really just asking those questions. And so we, we kind of start by proposing the, the, the simple upgrade. All right, our customer comes in, they've got two Group 31 lead acid batteries. They want to replace with lithium and they don't have a need for any 120 volt you know, inverted circuits. And so that, that's kind of the starting point for us. And we say, all right, well, what, what am I looking at? Well, first and foremost, I need to know what group size battery I need. So a couple BB-112s for that group 31. We go through, we check the charge profile like we talked about for the converter and the solar charge controller. And we give them that option of battery monitoring. So for me, whenever I tackle this this, this question or this install with a customer, I break it down to three pretty easy questions. How much power do you need? How do you want to charge your batteries? How do you want to monitor the state of charge in your batteries? And if we ask those questions, it pretty quickly starts to map out what that system should look like. All right, well, I need two batteries. I need a replacement board for a WFCO 8955 PEC. So we give them the progressive dynamics replacement and I give them the option of a smart shunt for Bluetooth battery monitoring. So for us, it's just going through asking those questions, qualifying the replacement parts needed. And all of a sudden we can give them a nice quote with the cost of the equipment, the cost of the batteries and our time. And we can do that successfully each and every time for that simple upgrade. So, again, we start to break it down in terms of, well, what, what is that gonna look like? So for a travel trailer, all right, here we go. We've got our two batteries on the tongue that we've replaced. We've got our WFCO 8955 where we've upgraded the board. We can qualify this MPPT that, hey, if it's a pretty blue box like Victron, it just takes a quick update to the Bluetooth to go ahead and make that lithium compatible and we integrate a BMV 712, we get all of our charging negatives to it, 
all of our discharge negatives to it. And now we've got a two inch display, we've got Bluetooth monitoring, and we've got a customer that's happy and able to pull this thing down the road and do whatever they'd like for off-grid camping. And really here's, here's the same sort of system in an RV. So what's different about it? Well, really the only change that we've made is we've got our converter, we've got our MPPT, We've added a DC to DC where we're pulling power from that starter battery back to a set of bus bars and ultimately charging the batteries up. So really the, the, the core of the, the steps in the system stays the same, whether it's motorized or towable. The only difference between these two systems is we've made the addition of bus bars with that added charging circuit and a DC to DC to manage that charge from the alternator itself. So for us, we've sort of created this formula for these simple systems to go through, qualify the chargers, pick the right batteries, and make yourself a nice little chunk of change by doing a, a quick and easy install. And what we don't show on here for the motorized installs is pretty much, you know, 90% of the motorhomes that are out there, they already have a dedicated charge line from the starter battery bank and the alternator back to that secondary auxiliary bank. It's usually in the form of some sort of simple solenoid or a bird or a BIM. So there's already some logic in there to open and close a circuit based on you driving or not driving. A lot of the times we'll just disable that circuit by simply pulling off the signal wire or the ignition wire off of the solenoid. Leave it there. You don't need to go through the trouble of pulling all that copper out. What you can do is use that solenoid for a bus bar so you can tap your input and your output for your DC to DC charger off of that solenoid. Because you've already got power coming from the starter bank to the solenoid. You got power from your secondary battery bank on the other side. Just run a bypass circuit to your DC to DC charger around that solenoid and you're working. Sometimes for the bigger class A's that kind of have a, a dual wire solenoid where it's a dual purpose where it will get an ignition signal to charge your auxiliary battery bank when you're driving. But if your starter batteries die, you're gonna push your boost button on your dash to get some back feed from your, your auxiliary bank to your starter battery bank. You can maintain the function of having that boost on that solenoid by just pulling the ignition wire, leaving the signal wire on that solenoid so you can still boost in an emergency. The lithium shouldn't be used to crank, but if you press and hold that momentary switch or it's a time delay switch, the lithium at the higher voltage has time to charge up your lead-based starter battery bank, and then you can crank after 30, 30 to 60 seconds or so. So in a motorhome, it's kind of, you got to look at what you already have, disable, make the decision to put in a DC to DC charger, or you can replace that solenoid system with the Precision Circuits Lithium Battery Isolation Manager. This is simply a sliding relay with logic in it that makes the decision to charge or not to charge based on time. So unlike a standard continuous duty solenoid, this has a timer in it. So if you give this ignition, it will charge for 15 minutes and then open the circuit for 20 minutes, almost giving like an alternator cool down period. So that's how it manages overworking an alternator is by putting in the time there. You can also run the signal wire to here for that momentary boost. So again, you gotta look at the motorhome, figure out what's gonna be best for the customer and their needs. Do I put in the DC to DC charger to get that regulated charge circuit at a programmable voltage? Or do I replace the solenoid with a lithium battery isolation manager? This is more of a retrofit in my mind. You'll never get a full charge off of this thing. Once this sees 13.3 volts on the lithium battery bank, it will no longer charge. This will allow you to get up to about a 90% state of charge on your lithium bank, no more. It will not charge it any higher. The DC to DC charger option, you can program it. You know exactly what the current is. So you know exactly what sort of charge you're getting when you're driving down the road. Sometimes you might need to use multiples of these to achieve that charge rate that you're looking for. But again, weigh the pros and cons. What does the customer need while they're driving? What sort of charge rate do you recommend for that DC to DC charger? What sort of capacity? Because so, you can get yeah. 20, 40, 60, 80 amps. I have a 160 amp alternator mm -hmm. on a 350 Cummins. So there's, 
it's, it's different. You know, you have to look at what the alternator size is. Some DC to DC charger manufacturers say in their manual not to exceed 50% of the max rate on the alternator. Okay. I think that's too much. I don't want to be using 50% of what that alternator can output. I don't want someone on the side of the road having to change out an alternator because they've overworked it. I stick to about 25 to 30% of the max rated of the alternator. Yeah. You know, if, so if you got a 160 amp alternator, I think maybe a 40 or 50 amp DC to DC charger max is appropriate. You know, that is a, a stock charging system that we're kind of robbing power from. Let's not take too much. Yeah. I think Victron says 30% of the alternator's output. I think Sterling is a uh, uh, fifty percent in their verbiage, so you'll get different companies give you different, mm -hmm. uh, you know, conservative or less conservative options. But I, I think what Brandon's saying, yeah, is is let's let's play it safe. Let's skew a little lower, and with the combination of solar and alternator, we should be able to get a pretty robust charge during the sunny part of the day. And I love the thought about using the bird relay solenoid. Just go in. We've got both sets of batteries right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, straight into that. And the bird is nice because they labeled everything for us. They did. We know where ignition is, relay, signal, ground. We can pull the wires off that we don't want anymore, put in the DC to DC, or replace the solenoid with those labeled wires and put them on the connection points here. So you got a couple good options there. And if, if the customer needs more, like, say you got a 160 amp salt or alternator, you need more than a 50 amp DC to DC charger on there, upgrade the alternator to a 220 or 280 there's usually a replacement option for all those popular chassis models like a Econoline 350 or, you know, you can pretty much bolt on a bigger alternator to most of the chassis out there. So this slide kind of went through the difference of, you know, what's the difference between a simple upgrade in a motorhome and a travel trailer? Well, you might be adding a component for regulated charging on a motorhome, which is that DC to DC charger. You added a circuit, you might start to be cluttering your terminals. So let's put in some bus bars to clean the whole thing up. You know, we like to put bus bars in just about every system if we can. Keep it simple. It keeps one circuit for you to switch. So you've got a master service disconnect switch where if you're doing maintenance, you're shutting down the system for storage. It's one circuit to kill the whole thing. You're shutting off the bus bars. Perhaps you route solar around the bus bar so the solar can always charge the batteries if necessary, but a couple ways to do it. So we take it from that simple to the next step, the, the, the full system overhaul. And so we, we get a lot of different scenarios that customers throw to us. I want to run my AC all day. I need to run that CPAP. I just want to install some magic batteries that do everything. Okay, well let's let's envision that. You know, and again, this is this is asking that that question. What are your expectations? What do you want to run? What do you need to run? And we'll kind of go through a little example here of, all right, well maybe this is what the customer wants to ask, what they want to run. So you know, I, I think we we have put this list together from experience in what we've learned to ask the customer what they've asked us in return. So when we're talking these big systems, I think the first thing we always have to ask is, are you running the air conditioner? And if so, is it for any significant amount of time? Do we just need to cool the space for half an hour or an hour? Or is this gonna run for all day? Uh, do we need to run more than one air conditioner? You know, are we talking a, a 30 or 50 amp service here? what else is in the RV that we need to consider? You know, are you a cook? Do you run an air fryer? Do you run an Instapot? Do you run any and all for your day to day? Do you want every outlet electrified from the inverter? Do you want to rely on solar as one of those primary charging sources? So we go through and we ask these questions and we get, we get some responses from folks and they say, yeah, I want to run an air conditioner. I've got a requirement that I work in the RV, so I need eight hours of air conditioning. I need to run a computer. I need my fridge. So it's starting to put together that energy assessment and we start to crunch these numbers so that we can build this system out. 
So it's essentially going through and helping, answer, you know, by going through and answering all these questions, we're starting to envision and build that system. And we like to do so not so much by just saying, well, I think, I think this component needs this much power. We'll actually list it out. All right, we've got an eight hour runtime. We've got an air conditioner and a fridge. And so in our example, all right, well, here's, here's what we've got. We've got a 30 amp travel trailer like we had in a previous slide. We want to be able to run that air conditioner and 12 volt fridge for eight hours with no charge input. This needs to be an eight hour autonomous period. And here's essentially what we're dealing with. So we're dealing with that 1300 watt average draw on the air conditioner. We're talking about a 12 volt fridge that pulls about four amps and now we can start to build this energy audit. And we can say, okay, well we need, we're, we know that we're gonna need somewhere in the ballpark of about 11 kilowatts of stored energy for this eight hour period. Now, for us, we know that there's some additional specifics we have to be aware of. Most modern inverters are gonna have a low voltage shutoff at about 15% remaining capacity in the battery bank, give or take. So we build in this additional 15% buffer for inverter shutdown and for some of those maybe unknown draws or parasitic draws that the customer's not accounting for. So we take that near 11 kW, we add 15%, and now all of a sudden we're just over 12 and a half kW of required battery bank. And we can now start to lay out what that looks like in terms of battery bank. So what makes more, more sense? Do we install 12 of these? Do we install four of these? You know, if we're, if we're thinking about what's best for the customer, well, it's probably gonna be easier to install four of these if we have the space, because we're gonna need less interconnects for the batteries, less copper, and it should make for a nice clean system. So all of a sudden our system's starting to take shape. All right, I know how much power I need. I know what the battery bank needs to look like. And by going with this, we're gonna have just under 13 kW of stored capacity. So that checks the box for what they need. We then have to ask, all right, well, what's the peak wattage? How much do we need to size for the inverter? And so we know that the highest draw is gonna be 1300 watts for that AC. So could we get away with a 2000 volt amp inverter? Possibly, you know, we know that that's gonna be able to provide 1600 watts at normal operating temperatures. But again, if we have some other unknowns that could come on at the same time, it's better to size up and give them that additional ceiling and go with a 3000 VA that'll give them 2400 watts. So going to that 3000 VA is gonna give us a little bit more flexibility. It's gonna account for any other 120 volt loads that they may not have thought of. And now we know, okay, we've got battery bank, we've got inverter sized. Now we can start to put together the makings of a system. And again, when we, when we laid out those initial questions, it was, are we talking 30 or 50 amp coach? And so now we can go through and we can choose what we best see fit for that 30 amp travel trailer that we're using for our example. We go with the 3000 VA on the far right, and we've got the right inverter picked out for this install. And so that's essentially how we're looking to go through and size this if we have some very specific requirements, we know the time frame that we need to account for, and we can put the system together for the customer. I think it might be, for those of you who have installed Victron in the past, who here has installed Victron? Okay, so did you install Victron before the 2x120 MultiPlus ever came out, the dual leg version? So it's still a popular installation but there can be some pitfalls in it. So the one that we're selecting here is just a single leg output. One line of 120, perfect for a 30 amp coach. Some people will put in two of them into a 50 amp RV, dedicating each one to a specific hotline. So you've got you know, L1 on master inverter, L2 on the following inverter. That, that works great. You got 3000 VA on either side of your main distribution panel. 
Each inverter is going to handle the loads on each side. So perhaps you do some load management by moving specific circuits to left and right side of that panel. But you're not getting the combined maximum output of those two inverters wherever you want in the system. The better way to do it now is if you need an inverter charger that's going to give you that 6,000 volt amp, that two inverter charger system, paralleling two of the dual leg versions makes you a 6,000 VA inverter charger system that you can put that 6,000 VA anywhere on the distribution panel, left or right side. Each one will do 50% of whatever the load is. If you got a 100 watt load from a TV on, each inverter in parallel will do 50 watts. So it kind of manages its own power distribution internally. The other reason that paralleling two of these is going to be better than split phasing these has to do with using the servo. So the servo, you need to have some sort of program between two inverters. So if you split phase the inverters, you have to go into the programming on a computer with like an MK3. This is just an adapter to hook up the inverters to your computer to program them. You have to tell the system to offset that second sine wave 180 degrees to get split phase 120, 240. Now you can see both inverters on your touchscreen. If you didn't program them to 120, 240 for split phase, and you just let each one of these inverters hotlines power left side or right side of the panel, that'll work fine. And a lot of people are doing that. You can't get both inverters on this touchscreen though. You have to pick which one you want. So there starts to be some pitfalls with the old school multi plus 3000s. If you ever get into a situation where you need to run two 3000 VA inverters in one system, pick the dual leg inversion or pick the dual leg version program them into parallel. And on this screen, you will see the whole system as one large 6,000 VA inverter, so your numbers will make sense. Another note is when you do split, uh, if you ever do a split phase inverter system where you're programming them to output 120, 240, you know, maybe you did that split phase just so you could see both inverters on your touchscreen. That system expects to see out of phase sine waves on those two hot legs. You go plug into a 120, 15, or 30 amp circuit, and you're giving the same phase 120 to both inverters, what do you think it's going to do? Nothing. You're not going to pass through that power. You're just going to stay inverting. You know, you're not utilizing that shore power. There is a hack where you can go in and program them so only the master inverter will charge and pass through, but that second inverter is always going to invert. So you could actually be charging at the same rate you're discharging running an air conditioner. They finally fixed that problem. You get two of the two legs, parallel them. Each one does 50% and it'll work in just about every situation. So now that we've selected our battery bank based on the consumption that we expect to have over eight hours, we've picked the inverter that we need for the coach and the power requirement, which is one 3000 VA inverter charger. How are we going to charge it when we're boondocking? Solar charging, if they want to boondock and they want to run that air conditioner long term and they don't expect to be at hookups for a while, fill the roof. You can never go wrong with too much solar on the roof. Now, if this is a, a pre-wired factory solar system on there, make sure that the wire that's coming down from the roof is rated for the right current for what you're going to put up there or put panels in series so you're minimizing the current that's going through that factory system. But if they want to boondock, they want to run the AC, and solar is their primary charging source, fill the roof. Maybe even give them some portable panels. A lot of the time, for what the expectations of our customers want, you can't get enough solar on the roof. It's just the way it is. So that's when you start going to, you know, DC to DC charger driving down the road for a travel trailer high energy alternator regulation for a motor home when you need to offset whatever you can't charge from solar when you're driving from place to place. So fill the roof if you can. If this is kind of more of a simple system and the customer just wants to throw in two batteries, at least get them 200 watts of solar per battery. You know, if you run the math on it, this is roughly a 1200 watt hour battery. In the summer, you get six hours of good sun, 
1200 watt hours divided by six hours, you're left with 200 watts. That's kind of why it's our minimum recommendation. If someone's up north and they got a poor solar angle or in the Pacific Northwest where it's not always sunny, it's cloudy more than that, maybe three to 400 watts is better than that. But down here in Florida where you're not, you know, you've got a pretty good sun angle relatively throughout the whole year, 200, 250 watts minimum, you're probably pretty good. So once you start figuring out how much solar you're gonna put on the roof or how much you can put on the roof, now you gotta start sizing your solar charge controller based on the wattage and the voltage of the battery bank. So Victron has this chart on their website that you can find where it's basically saying, okay, based on the current rating of each controller, which for Victron, it's a two number system, it's a 75 slash 10. That means it will handle maximum 75 volts in. So that's your limitation on putting panels in series with a 10 amp output. You'll never get more than 10 amps output on it. That's a direct translation to how many watts you can put on the roof to effectively charge with this controller. So the most common one on the market is going to be the 30 amp solar charge controller. That equates to about 440 watts of input. Now in PWM world, where everything is just kind of pushing current through, that's about 600 watts. You know, you can overdrive a solar charge controller a little bit because we can always expect inefficiencies in the solar panels. You get a 200 watt panel, rarely do you get 200 watts, maybe on those cold, crisp days in the morning, but you can expect inefficiencies. You can slightly overdrive, but for the customer, because they may end up reading the manual one day, and you put 600 watts on a controller that says in the manual it'll only handle 440, they may question you on that. So I do like to size strictly based on this chart here. So if you're gonna put 600 watts on the roof, we know it's only 30 amps of current coming down from a 12 volt array, I would still step it up to the 50 amp controller. Electronics always last longer if you're not driving them to 100%. So, you know, in this case, we would have tried to fill the roof like if you start looking at the numbers for how much wattage we need to run eight hours of air conditioning, we need over like 2000 watts to be able to replenish that eight hours. Only on a big class A can you get 2000 watts on the roof. So fill that roof with whatever you can get. Maybe it's 1200 to 1600 watts on like a class C. A couple portable panels, good alternator charging system. They should be able to replenish that battery bank. In the calculations for how much uh, battery power we need, we don't factor in cycle time on the air conditioner because we can't guarantee that. Some RVs have great insulation, good four season camper, it's got good insulation. You might be able to achieve a 50% cycle time on that compressor where you're really minimizing the power that you're consuming. But if you've got an old stick and tin with some terrible insulation on there, you know, go outside today, that thing is just gonna that's gonna run full bore all the time. You can't count for any sort of cycles. So you always wanna factor in kind of the unknowns as well, because the customer may, may not tell you everything. So now we've learned the battery bank. We need about 13 kilowatt hours of battery, so we would use four of these batteries, which sounds like a lot of battery. It's becoming pretty average. You know, people are, are asking for these big, high energy power systems now. Like these guys at Airstream of Tampa, they'll do four GC3 systems, six GC3 systems sometimes. You know, you know, we've got guys with up to 20 of these in a trailer. You know, sometimes money is no object and they'll just <laughs> put in whatever they can so they're better than their buddy. But <clears throat> you start to learn your system. So four batteries, get the right inverter charger to support the demand. Get as much solar on the roof that you can. From a calculation standpoint, this system needs 2,400 watts of solar, which if they're 12 volt banks, you would need two 100 amp solar charge controllers. It's a big solar charge controller. You're running probably two gauge to that. So what calculations do you do in putting these sort of systems in travel trailers? Because for every pound of this stuff you put in, right. you reduce the cargo carrying capacity Mm -hmm. of what you can tow down the road. So, right. you know, anytime you put more than 100 pounds in, you have to do a recalculation, I understand. Whether it's a motorhome or travel trailer, you right. take that into account and advise the client that, you know. Yeah, 
you know, Granny can't come with you now because, <laughs> you know, I've got too much soda on the way. From our standpoint, we will advise the customer of that, you know, advise them of the weight that they're looking at for the system that they want. They may change what they ask for based on that because we can't know every RV in every RV manufacturer. You know, you at the dealer level, you can look into that a little bit more and make recommendations based on the, the travel trailer that they have. We can advise from our side to take a look at that. You may want to consider a smaller system based on the size travel trailer, RV, cargo capacity, but that's definitely something to take into consideration. So we'll get into some of the wiring specifics now for, again, a lot of the, the parts and pieces we've talked about. So let's, let, let's start with the, the easy stuff. Um, so again, with our batteries, series or parallel is an option. Series up to 48 volts. Parallel, well, well, we'll get into some parallel limitations or what we feel we should limit at, and it'll be more string size than overall system size. I think the, the biggest thing to take from this is we feel there's, there's a right way to do it and there's one right way to do it. And when we're talking parallel, well, we're, we're gonna try to move away from that traditional lead acid parallel where they may string them all together and just run positive and negative off of one battery. So with low resistance lithium batteries, we wanna take positive and negative from opposite ends of the bank. This is gonna allow for very even charge and discharge. So that way we know that the batteries will be able to provide you everything they've got and all come up to charge evenly. Series 24, 36, 48 volt. I know we've talked to a couple folks about trolling motors. So if we're talking a trolling motor install or a higher voltage install. Well, again, we're pairing positive and negative. We're gonna pull from opposite ends of the battery bank to get that high vol higher voltage system. I think one of the things we always like to note with 24, 36, or 48 volt is we like to take each individual battery, charge it up charge it up on its own before we wire into series. That way we're starting across the board with a full battery bank and we still expect that same unison performance of charge and discharge to get the full capacity of the bank itself. We like to throw the wire, wire sizing chart in here just because when we're adding circuits to the RV, we have to take into account what wire gauge, what size we need. So it's always a question of what sort of current we're gonna have demand, uh, what kind of length we have. And again, the shorter the length that we can account for, the more efficient we can be in terms of delivering power through that circuit. So just something to note, typically when we're talking these higher power systems, we're looking at big gauge wire when it's a 12 volt battery bank. So. Not uncommon to use 4 aught to interconnect those batteries, to run batteries to inverter, just to make sure that when that high demand kicks in, we're not dealing with any excessive heat. Um, there's, there's gonna be no risk there in the system. So here's something that's, you know, again, more of an actual, something you're gonna see. So a couple interstates that we found on the, you know, battery box on the tongue of a trailer. Here's that traditional parallel wiring. So we pull our batteries out, we replace with a couple lithium, and we take into account all of our negatives there for charging circuits. So batteries in parallel, positive to positive, negative to negative, shunt in place, and negatives connected to that system side of the shunt. So again, everything we like to do, we try to do with this specific formula in mind so that there's the consistency for each and every install. If we look here, we just go into slightly more detail on that shunt install. What's great about all the Victron product, all the Victron shunts, is that they've given us pretty easy to follow instructions with their labeling. So we know system and battery side on the smart shunt. We've got the same sort of labeling here on the front of the shunt for any of the battery monitors. So everything has been made really as obvious as they can so that we get the right connections in the right places and we can do the proper wire management so that everything can be tracked efficiently. You can see we've got just a couple different orientations there. So whether it's a single 
two, three battery or larger, we, we run with the same sort of technique, the same steps to make a single connection from primary negative to shunt and all of the negatives come to the system side of the shunt. What do you all think happens if you wire in a shunt wrong? It doesn't work. Yeah. The shunt is a calculating device, so it has to see all the current coming in and out of the battery bank. So if you were to wire a negative in this system straight to the battery terminal, bypassing this shunt, it can no longer see the current moving through there. Calculations are off. Your customer is going to call you. They're going to have to have someone fix it. Kind of just spirals into a mess. And it's a really easy mistake to do. You just have to make sure that all negatives land on that system side of the shunt so that the shunt can accurately see all charge and discharge going to the bank. So Eric had mentioned that we kind of get to a maximum parallel at a specific point. You know, actually that was a different slide. So this is just kind of using the, sh the shunts here. You know, we don't want to clutter our terminals with a ton of wires. The more wires you put on a single terminal, the greater chance you have of those wires actually coming loose as you're bouncing down the road, or you might not good con get con good conductivity through all of those uh, cable lugs to the terminal. So this is why we like to start using bus bars. Give every circuit its own stud or double up some small circuits on studs. Make it clean. By doing it this way, you can have one switch that shuts down the whole system. The shunt you know is going to be watching all of the current from all your circuits because all your negative cables are up on your bus bar. So here's the excessive parallel in the battery banks. You know, if, if someone decided that using 12 of this battery, based on limitations on where they can put it, is better than four of these batteries, you probably don't want to just string all of these in a row of 12, hook up positive on one end, negative on the other. That's probably adding too much resistance to get to all the batteries in the bank. So at a certain point, Six has always been my limitation. You know, I would never do more than six batteries in a row, positive, negative, on either end. At that point, if you're more than six, say you're at eight, not seven. Seven's a prime number. It's hard to split that up. Say you're at eight batteries. I'd split them to four and four. Run each battery bank with a positive and negative off either side. Run it up to a battery bus bar. You've then paralleled two sub banks at a bus bar. From those bus bars, you can go to a fuse and a switch or a shunt on the negative to run up to a system bus bar. So that's just kind of a best practice so you don't end up with these long strings of batteries where the middle batteries aren't really getting much love for charge and discharge. We see that a lot. I've got a guy with a system with 20 100 amp hour batteries in parallel and he ended up running uh, five different banks of 400 amp hours, all to like a Lynx distributor, which is just a fancy bus bar. System works great. He took the proper precaution. He's got appropriate size gauge cable, all of his sub banks going to a bus bar. No one would ever think to put 20 batteries into a 12 volt system. We amp clamp it all the time. It's working great, so. So if we get into a heated battery install, we also want to make sure that the heat is enabled for the customer. We've got three different options to heat enable batteries. So you can see our GC2 here is one of the heated versions. Really the only thing that distinguishes the heated battery from a non is this four millimeter threaded insert. This is our heat enable circuit. So a few different ways that we can activate the heat and the heat strip in this battery itself. Well, the, the easiest way, and all the heat wiring will come with the battery, is we take the 18 gauge couple inch wire, we go from positive to heat enable, and that activates the heat circuit and the internal thermistor. So if we run it that way, we can do it to where each and every heated battery is going to kick on that heat when the thermistor hits 35 degrees. So that's, that's the automatic way, that's the set it and forget it way. And really it just allows that heated battery to activate whenever it senses that the temperature is cold enough. So that's, that's one way. The, the second way we can do it is we can 
continue to do that, set it and forget it. And we can jump from battery to battery to battery so that they're essentially all linked together and they can all trigger basically, well, more or less at the same time in a parallel string. Again, it's all gonna be based on internal temperature of the battery. So we may see those come on and come off at slightly different times, but we can use just a single heat enable and then power that to corresponding batteries. What you'll see as kind of the, the overarching theme here is that we want the primary positive battery in that string to be the initial heat enable battery in the, in the string itself. So that way we're getting the highest voltage battery to basically provide that power to each and every battery down the string. The third and final option that we've got to enable this is we give an optional switch. This is my preference. And, and reason being is that we're essentially drawing power from the battery to, to heat it. So there are scenarios where, yeah, the temperature might be cold enough, but we may not have any active charging source feeding power to the battery. So my thought is, well, for overnight hours, there's no reason for this heat to come on. There's no active charge typically of we're boondocking. We're not driving, we're not harvesting solar. So if we install that switch, which will run to the positive and to the heat enable circuit, the customer then has the option to turn the heat on and off, just like you would the lights at the end of the day. So again, a number of different ways to integrate it. It's all strategy at that point. How involved does the customer wanna be in turning that heat on and off? Or do they just want something where they can set it, forget it, and the off chance that they get into those freezing temps, they've got batteries that will automatically heat themselves and they don't have to think about when the charge comes in or when it doesn't. Except in storage. Except, Except in storage, storage. yep. I've had some customers come in with their batteries because they had them right like that in storage. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. So if you do have a customer that stores the RV for the winter, you will want to disable that heat enable wiring so that this doesn't drain the batteries and they're left with a dead battery bank when they come back in the spring. So, great point. I know, yeah. So, there are some, again, depending on the model, there are some different placements of that heat enable circuit. You know, typically on our more traditional batteries, they're gonna be right here on the top, on the GC2, right here in the middle. But on the GC3, you do have to remove that top terminal cover, and then you can access the four millimeter screw. Oh, I'm sorry, the foot, yes. Yeah, because it's tucked back right here. So that's kind of wired up the batteries, you know, whether we're gonna parallel series connect the batteries, how do we integrate the heat enable into a series or parallel situation, whether it's bus bars or not. Now we start looking at kind of more general practices for installing all of these components that we have on the table. So, when you start thinking about what these high energy systems are gonna look like or a retrofit, we've all got into the mind frame of using bus bars and the bus bars tend to be that kind of central piece of the whole system. So if you start looking at diagrams that any of our guys will start to sketch up, these are not technical diagrams by any means, more of a, a visual indicator, you start seeing that there's always a bus bar in the center of whatever we're doing. With the bus bar, that allows us to connect the battery bank through a switch and a shunt to the bus bar. DC to DC charger connects to the bus bar. Solar charge controller connects to the bus bar. 12 volt distribution connects to the bus bar. Inverter connects to the bus bar. So you've got a, a place to put all of these circuits on that bus bar. You do wanna make sure that every circuit is properly protected, whether it be with uh, breakers or fuses, but everything has a place to connect to so you can get good distribution out of that system. These diagrams, they all use this Lynx distributor. This is nothing more than a thousand amp bus bar set with uh, four places to put mega fuses. So you can have a fused connection point on this positive bus bar for your inverter charger, DC-DC, solar charge controller, 12 volt distribution, Maybe that's not enough. All right, you've got some extruding terminals that come out here, which can mate into another one. 
you can just run a long set of these bus bars to have as many fuse points as you want. Ma max I've ever seen in a system is three. But if you can start getting into that mind frame of thinking about where am I going to put a bus bar in the system? Where are all of the circuits distributing out from that bus bar to all your charging sources, discharging sources? Where is your battery bank? You start to design a system, and once you start like just drawing diagrams, maybe you give your customer a diagram of what you've done, I don't know. They start to all look the same. You're changing components, you're changing the size of the battery bank, you're adding multiple inverters, but everything basically looks the same. You've got a central bus bar, and you've got components connecting to it, including a battery bank. So again, we want to hammer it home, use bus bars. Do not end up with a situation that looks like four, five, six cables just sitting right on some battery terminals. It looks ugly. The customer looks at it. They see a rat's nest. A clean install is generally a functional install. If you look at your own install and you can't quite pinpoint where the wires are going, your customer won't be able to see it either and it's harder to troubleshoot over the phone or maintain that system down the road. So inverter charger, just the basics of an inverter charger is that it's an inverter to go from 12 volt to 120 for all of your 120 loads. It's also a charger that replaces your converter in your distribution panel or that deck mount. And it's usually a high amperage charger. So in order to have those two components rolled into one big box, it, ha it needs to have an automatic transfer switch to select between its different roles. So with an automatic transfer switch, that means that you're intercepting what used to be just a circuit from you know, your shore power plug, your transfer switch, your generator, whatever. You got your 120 input. It used to run just straight to your distribution panel. You had your 12 volt converter in there. Everything was managed good. To put in an inverter charger, you're just intercepting that circuit so that the input of the inverter charger comes from your shore, your generator, your automatic transfer switch, and the output goes to your 120 distribution panel. Now this box is able to make the decision of, am I powering the 120 circuits from the battery and inverting, or if it senses shore power or 120 at its input from the generator or the transfer switch, it switches over to a pass-through function and charges the batteries at the same time. So it's a really smart component, all built into one thing. All inverter chargers kind of install at this same general, general way. You've got an AC input, an AC output, and then 12 volt battery hookups for charging or discharging through the inverter. So just a really easy to follow solar wiring. Again, with most RVs, you're gonna have, you know, possibly a single or dual solar panels on the roof. Um, it's, it's really as simple as just knowing that we've got PV input, battery output, positive and negative labeled. Essentially, we'd like to see circuit protection on both sides of that PWM or MPPT. I think what we're seeing common now for DIYers and installers is to have a PV breaker that they can use as both circuit protection and also a disconnect switch, something that they can physically move to on or off. What's nice with Victron is that they do have an internal setting that you can enable or disable the charger through Bluetooth so that if you'd like to have that secondary on off, you have the function via the MPPT itself. Um, we've got it sized where essentially we're fusing the output on that positive. Um, if we follow any sort of code, you know, it's 1.2 times the output at a minimum. So on a 30 amp controller like this, we would wanna to go to at least a 35 or 40 amp fuse to protect. I always like to size up and I would probably go to a 45 or 50 amp fuse, again, just to protect that circuit in the output. Um, again, fuse size is gonna be dependent on the, the max output of the controller itself. And really we can do anything from an inline blade fuse all the way up to an ANL or mega fuse, depending on the, the space and the customer's preference. Um, we'll get into some of the DC to DC wiring now. And I know earlier we talked about isolated versus non-isolated. We've talked about the BIM. 
So let's, let's make sure we're all understanding the kind of charging and wiring basics of these. So isolated first, like I've got here. Now with this, it's going to require dedicated positive and negative for both the input and the output. With these 30 amp Orion's max wire gauge is number six. I tend to go with that max wire gauge just so that if we have a long run, we can make up for any of those inefficiencies. Typically for installation, I'll try to place this as close as I can to the house battery bank in an effort that I know this can accept a wide range of input voltages. It's gonna take anywhere from 10 volts on the low end all the way up to 19 volts on the high end. So you can really accept a wide range. It will boost that voltage and it will still provide that 30 amp output as stated. So again, six gauge from the starter battery of the vehicle. We run a 60 amp fuse in line from that source to the input of the DC to DC. We mimic that with six gauge output, an additional 60 amp fuse to protect that output circuit. And we've got this thing all set and wired up. With that, we also come to the programming of this device. Now, we're gonna find a wide range of alternators out there from standard to smart. What we can do with this device is we can also use it to isolate, but we have to set the start and stop voltages based on alternator type. Uh, so this thing really knows when to fire and when not to. So easy way that I think you can go ahead and set that is really just by taking a couple voltage readings of the starter battery with the vehicle off and with the vehicle at idle, then we can go and we can start to set those thresholds so that we know this is going to truly go to an isolated state when the, the key is off. And as soon as we turn that key on and the alternator starts to feed power to the starter battery, we've got the appropriate voltage to trigger this on and start a charge cycle. So that's your isolated, that's the DC to DC basics. So basically just to show a visual of what that isolated versus non looks like. So we've got an example here on a travel trailer. You can see that we've got an Anderson connector that we've designed as part of the charging circuit here. So isolated is great in that it'll work for both a towable and a motorized. We're essentially just building those positive and negative inputs and then outputs for this DC to DC charger. If we're doing it on a towable, then yeah, we wanna use that six gauge Anderson quick disconnect so that we can pull that just like we would the seven or four pin when we go to disconnect the tow vehicle from the trailer itself. On a towable, well, we can go with either an isolated or non-isolated depending on really preference. But the big difference is we're gonna have the positive input and output we're just gonna have a single dedicated chassis ground to tie that circuit together. So really that's the, the, the physical difference that you're gonna see between these two different isolated and non DC to DC chargers. So the BIM, and again, we've, we've put a, you know, just more of your traditional solenoid um, schematic up here. So, Again, positive input, positive output that we've got. As far as the BIM goes, this is gonna be a four wire requirement. Fifth wire is optional, depending on if you'd like the bi-directional function and the signal pin to trigger that for that emergency jump start or boost function. So you can see as we've got it laid out on our schematic here, we've got our two positives, we've got our chassis ground, we're tying in a 12 volt, 12 volt switched source. So something that will essentially tell this that the key is turned on. So it's an ignition signal. And that's our four required with that fifth being the signal pin if we'd like it to, again, have that bi-directional jump. Wake speed. So without going too far down the rabbit hole on how to install a wake speed, We've got a few different things that we look at for qualifying this and if it's right for use in a mobile application. So the first thing I always look at with a customer is, are they using a battery that qualifies with the wake speed? We do some very specific testing on the batteries themselves. The biggest thing for us is load dump. So it's essentially what happens if for some reason a battery shuts down 
and we aren't able to trigger and tell the alternator that that shutdown has happened. So we essentially want there to be some protection in the system against load dump. So we've got a qualified list of battery brands that we know will work with wake speed in different voltage uh, orientations. So first and foremost is qualify the batteries. Second is we need to qualify the alternator in the customer's vehicle or qualify that a second alternator is gonna work. And so what we really need to look for is external regulation and the ability to tap into stator and field, field sensing on the alternator itself. From there, we pick a harness. And really there's only a couple harnesses available for wake speed. It's either a P or an N type alternator. Since we don't live in Europe, it's gonna be a P type alternator. Um, and it's ultimately, if we're gonna need a van harness for a longer vehicle, or the more traditional P-type harness. Once we do that, we look at accessories, which could be temperature sensors, crossover cables to communicate with the Victron system, or uh, a secondary shunt so that we can better monitor how much current is coming from the alternator itself. And then we follow our instructions for all the wire placement. And so as we look at these harnesses, you can really kind of dissect this into three sections. And I won't un unfurl this because there's a lot going on, but we essentially have a alternator, a battery, and more or less kind of a, a sensor, or uh, what am I thinking of, a panel section of this wire. And so that's how we kind of dissect the wake speed harness itself, is we've got our main connection to the regulator itself. We've got our CAN connection for communication on the bottom of the regulator. And then we run each of these segments to different parts of the system. And so that's what really makes the wake speed a great option is we're sensing voltage, we're sensing current, and we're sensing, sensing temperature of both the batteries and the alternator itself. So it takes some steps to really kind of make sure that we're placing all the wires in the appropriate places but we can guide you through those steps if you have a customer looking to implement that, that high energy charging source from a motorized vehicle. And you can go as far as putting in one, two, third uh, aftermarket alternator. Like we do, we work with a couple of Prevost companies where we will do three aftermarket alternators. You can either have three wake speed or one wake speed drive all of those alternators with multiple wake speeds, like you see in this example here, you get redundancy. Should for some reason one go down, they're communicating, so one of them takes over the charge profile of the rest of them. But imagine having 12,000 watts being pumped into a large battery bank driving down the road in a Prevost bus. It's, it's something to see on a battery monitor. So now that we've kind of gone through and we've We've started installing all of these components. Again, we're centralizing everything around a main bus bar. We've taken our battery bank. We have run it through circuit protection and a switch for that master cutoff. We've put the negative through a shunt up to the bus bar. Everything else just comes into the bus bar. And we've got our appropriate customer facing panel. You know, basically you can hide everything in this system except for that customer control panel. You wanna give them that visual or the Bluetooth so they can see what's going on. But you know, get in the habit of starting to draw diagrams until you really get comfortable doing these every single time. Once you start drawing them all, it really starts to click. You know, start picking components, sizing the wire, sizing the battery bank to different inverter chargers. So it, it, it's always good to have something like this for a custom one-off install for a customer. If you can hand them what they've done and they can see what you've done and go into that compartment and trace the wires in your diagram, they're gonna be happy. You know, that kind of comes down to that PDI where you wanna show your customer what you've done before they leave and show them how to operate it. We get a lot of phone calls from installers who may not have done the best job. They didn't show their customer how they did the installation, show them how everything works. We get a phone call saying, well, how does all this stuff work? Well, send us some photos, we'll try and help you. And we just see this rat's nest. Everything's miswired. You do not want that. So take the time to learn it. 
draw some diagrams, figure it out, and give us a call if you have questions. All right, guys, so home stretch. You survived three plus hours of batteries. Thank you. Um, so th this, is, this is our last section. Um, we'll we'll kind of move through this. We'll, we'll leave a few minutes for questions if you have it. Um, a couple things before we jump into the last, this last section. We will make this entire presentation available. So if you'd like it, leave us an email address and we'll send a PDF out to anyone who would like this for future reference. Um, I think we'll try to do a group photo if you guys want to stick around so we can share it with the FRVTA. Um, so let's get into the last, this last section. So for the bulk of the presentation, we talk about who we are, lithium batteries, the systems. We want to spend a few minutes talking about the future because again, as a battery tech company, we're constantly trying to obsolete what we're doing today. And, you know, it's like any tech company out there, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will be happy with the original iPhone still, but it's pretty cool that we've got one with, you know, battery that runs all day and badass camera in it and everything that it currently does. So we're, we're doing the same. So what is our battery missing? What, what can we add to it to make it better? Um, this new technology that we've come out with, Dragonfly Intelligence, we'll have it available in October. Uh, it's gonna make for wireless communication within all the batteries. And so we've been talking about this for a number of months now, and a lot of people go, okay, Bluetooth battery, we've seen it before. We've designed something a little different. Um, one of the big issues that I think people have always had with Bluetooth is that you have a slightly limited range and you typically have some spotty connection just due to a single antenna in the Bluetooth typically. So we're developing a wireless mesh network in the batteries. It'll be multiple antenna. It'll give you a 80 to 100 foot range. So we feel like it's gonna give a better overall performance with that wireless connection for the battery itself. And we don't want you to have to go through and, and read all this info. So that's why we're trying to recap it here. Um, essentially that, that wireless network will give us a few different options. So at the root of it, it'll be app based. You'll be able to see direct info from battery to a phone, to a tablet. Um, but it'll do more than that. So we'll have some accessories to go with this wireless network. Um, one of those accessories will be a small device called a hub. And again, if we provide internet connection to that hub, we can then see the batteries and the complete system from anywhere in the world. So the hub will be fairly small. It's gonna be smaller than the, the smart dongle by, by size. And it gives you a couple different options. So you can see individual battery state of health, voltage, um, really anything that you'd want. You can also see aggregated info. So all the batteries will communicate to one another and tell you about the complete system health. With that hub, it'll have a, a port on it. So whether it's RVC, NEMA 2K, um, whatever the, the protocol is, we can then plug into the corresponding system in the RV, in the boat, and have communication with that system as well. So it's gonna allow for our app that we're developing, we're almost done with, to have full communication with the system as a whole. So we're really excited about that, it eliminates that battery monitor from the system itself and gives the customer that much further detail and data about the batteries that they didn't have before. It also is gonna help us from a troubleshooting standpoint in pinpointing exactly where the problem is in the system if there is one. So we'll be able to see a specific battery if it's having charge or discharge issues and then direct the customer to a fix. So integration, again, we'll be able to, to talk to Victron. We'll be able to tap into wake speed. Uh, really anything that's using a true RBC protocol, you know, our hope is that it's going to be the spider system, Firefly, yes, uh, Silverleaf. So any of those popular, um, you know, whole RV monitoring systems, uh, Neiman 2K, which we see as kind of the, the standard that we see in a lot of sailboats and marine vessels, um, VE bus, VE can. So 
again, we're, we're working to validate all these different communication protocols and bring this online when we launch these batteries here in a couple months. We hope that you can, everyone can stop programming too, because along with that communication, that given data to a monitoring system, you plug our hub into a Victron inverter charger, auto programming, it's done. Just integrates the whole thing for you. So eventually we want to make the whole thing a lot easier. So just kind of a sneak peek of the app itself. Um, again, like, like with any app, it, you know, it should be pretty slick. What we're going to do for future batteries is we'll have a laser etched QR code on every one of these smart batteries that's produced. You take your app, you take a photo of each QR code in the system, and you start to assign it placement in the system itself. So that's how it starts to build your battery bank in the app. You assign it either parallel or series configuration, and it then starts to give you state of health, state of charge. Um, you can get push notifications that if you do have an issue, it's gonna alert you to that, just like you'd get a text message. We want it to be easy for setup, easy for the customer to understand, and better yet, easy for all of us to decipher and know what's going on in that system itself. So just a couple more screenshots. Everything will be color-coded to the individual batteries to show that state of health, state of charge. Um, again, you get a notification, it'll show you if there's gonna be some sort of imbalance, low voltage, high voltage event, so everything will be pushed directly to you. You know, there's, there's a bunch of Bluetooth batteries out on the market right now, but each of them, you have to look individually at each battery in the system. So you can't really aggregate all that data into, okay, I know what each individual battery's doing, but what about the whole battery bank and the state of health of the battery bank altogether? So with that hub, you know, one small hub about the size of this, it will talk to all the batteries in the system all your accessories in the system, and it will give you a snapshot of the whole system as a whole with the option to dive in deeper to look at each battery individually. So we're trying to give you the whole picture of the whole system with our app, not just each individual battery like everyone else. So <clears throat> along with that hub, which is gonna be your communication center for the, the Dragonfly Intelligence System, we're gonna have a couple accessories to go along with it. One of them is the ION digital inputs and outputs. So now we have the ability to run relays, trigger auto gen starts, flood sensors, you know, signaling lights and noise buzzers. There's actually an alarm built into this ION so we can pre-program uh, set point alarms. That becomes very crucial for ABYC, the American Boat and Yacht Council. They need to know when things are happening with the batteries because they always have that high energy alternator charging coming off their motors. So for them, they need a buzzer and a light if something's gonna to happen to the battery. And with this, we're able to give it that. But with the ION, I'm excited to start doing you know, auto generator starts, auto chassis starts, so you can start your vehicle to have it start charging the batteries if you don't have a generator. Anything that you wanna turn on or turn off based on state of health, voltage, anything like that, this will be able to do it. The other accessory that we have is more geared towards high voltage systems, like 48 volt systems or 24 volt systems. It's called the Flex. So it's basic, basically a, uh, a switch gear for balancing. So you actually connect each individual 12 volt battery to its own bus bar selected spot on the Flex. You get to pick whether those batteries are wired in 12, 24, 36 if it's three or 48 volt. So you can actually change the series parallel configuration on the fly. Why you need that is because in 48 volt battery banks, you're taking individual 12 volt batteries and putting them in series. Eric had mentioned earlier that it is always the best practice, not even for lithium, just any battery bank. You put those batteries in series when they are all at the same state of charge, which means you fully charge each 12 volt battery before you put them in series so you know you're starting with a battery bank that is in balance all the way across. If you didn't do that, or if you never fully charged the batteries to get into that BMS passive cell balancing, your batteries in your series string start to get at different state of charge. And you're always limited to your lowest state of charge in the 48 volt bank as you're discharging. 
you got 100% battery and a 50% battery and 24 volts, as you discharge it, when the lower battery hits low voltage disconnect, battery bank shuts off. You've got an imbalance in the batteries that's hard to resolve unless you disconnect them or put on isolated 12 volt chargers. This changes it. We can actually program this to reconfigure the battery bank from 48 volt back to a 12 volt battery bank, charge them all in parallel at 12 volts, balance all of the cells within the battery bank, and then auto program it back to 48 volts. So the, the use of doing that auto balancing, it's, it's more beneficial when you have multiple strings of batteries in the system. Because if you've got multiple batteries in the system, you can turn off one 48 volt string to do passive balancing at 12 volts while you're operating on the other two. And then that one comes back online and it rotates to the next one. It balances that one, balances the next one. You can schedule it on based on time or calendar events. You can have it do auto balancing based on an imbalance. So if your hub, your intelligent system, senses that one battery is a little bit lower out of a certain tolerance, it'll auto balance that system or send you a push notification or alarm. Balancing is something that nobody really talks about, you know, and this is more geared towards like home wall pack systems like the LG Chem 48 volt or the, you know, the power wall type battery banks. But I mean, it'll work in an RV too once everything goes to 48 volt, which there's a huge, huge push for that right now, so. So again, this is that hybrid balancing technology. All the batteries that are hooked up to this flex will be individually monitored. If one goes out of balance, it will send a push notification to your phone that you have an imbalance instead of the customer calling you and saying, hey, my battery bank shut down while I was at 50%. If you're in a 24 or 48 volt system, it is possible one battery's out of balance, it hit low voltage disconnect, shut down the whole system prematurely. Now you'll get some insight into why that happened in a higher voltage system. So this flex is a critical component for us to build a home wall pack. Now I know we're here talking about RVs and everything, but we're gonna have a 48 volt, 100 amp hour wall pack, five kilowatt hours. You could put this in an RV, absolutely. It's just a larger box and it may take a specific compartment to fit so. But this is gonna be a 48 volt, 100 amp hour battery bank that's using that flex to deal with the 48 volt balancing issues that we see out on the market right now. So that's something that we have never done. We've never really stepped into that kind of home wall pack battery backup residential market. Now we're getting into that and we'll be releasing this later this year. Fully configurable, you can stack them all. Um, we're gonna integrate that communication to work with Schneider, Victron, Solar converter chargers, if you've heard of them. Um, again, it's all that pre-programming. So once we just kick, connect an ethernet cable between the battery and the inverter, pre-programs everything, you can see everything on one communication device, be a good system. So here is uh, just how you wire up that home wall pack. Again, we're using that flex that allows for that hybrid balancing. So you need a 12 volt charge port. So we have an additional 12 volt bus on the bottom. So you can operate at 48 volt between 48 and ground or charge for the balancing. And we're, we'll provide that 12 volt charger. So when things do go out of balance at 48 volt, maybe once a year or so, it'll do that automatic 12 volt passive balancing. And so really evolution of batteries. So this is kind of where we're at now, moving through flooded lead acid AGM lithium starting to take that bigger presence in the rv market we'll have our smart lithium batteries out this october and again the the further goal for us to try and obsolete current technology is moving towards a solid state cell being a u.s battery tech company we've got a pilot line that's built to start building our own anode and cathodes here in-house in the u.s um, as more mines get established in nevada We'll start to be able to take raw material out of the ground, process the raw material, and ultimately bring the supply chain more vertically integrated and bring it in-house. So the end goal for us is to build a solid state cell that we're manufacturing on our own. What that ultimately means is the highest level of safety for a lithium ion battery so that we can offer, whether it be a mobile or 
stationary power user uh, the best experience possible with lighter weight, smaller batteries, and really the, the highest level of safety. So that for us is, is sort of where we see the evolution going. And it's, it's ultimately on our roadmap here over the next couple of years to have this technology out on the market for all of you to sell. Um, short of that, we've got our contact info up here. Like I said, if you'd like a copy of this presentation, we're happy to email it to you so that you can have future reference of it. And uh, I think with any remaining time that we have left, if you have any questions, we're, we're certainly happy to answer them. Um, so feel free to, to let us know.